Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's open our Bibles to Hosea chapter 4. The Lord's controversy with Israel. Let's stand before our feet, on our feet before the Lord our God. He says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish, with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Yet let no man strive nor reprove another, for thy people are as they that strive with the priests. Therefore shalt, shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me, Therefore will I change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people, and they set their heart on their iniquity. And there shall be like people like priests, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their doings. For they shall lead and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase, because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. My people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declareth unto them, for the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err, and they have gone a whoring from under their God. They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills under the oaks and poplars and elms, because the shadow thereof is good. Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom, and your spouses shall commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery, for themselves are separated with whores, and they sacrifice with harlots. Therefore the people that doth not understand shall fall. Though thou, Israel, play the harlot, yet let not Judah offend. And come not ye unto Gilgal, neither go you up to Bethaven, nor swear the Lord liveth. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. Their drink is sour and they have committed whoredom continually. Her rulers with shame do love give ye. The wind hath bound her up in her wings and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Thus saith the word of the Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. And Father, where we've been found lacking and wanting, Lord God, this morning, Father, we ask that you forgive us from all sins. Lord, it's not, Lord God, our heart's desire, Lord Jesus, that we be turned away and not forgiven by you, Lord. But Father God, we want the mercies that you renew for us every day, Lord God. Lord, without those mercies, we can't make it in this life, and the devil will have open, open road to us, Lord God, to do whatever he wants to do with us, Lord. And how he wants to do it. And if you just said in your word, Lord, if we don't take heed, Lord God, and, and seek you and repent, Lord God, then he'll have our children, Lord. And that's what he's after, Lord God. The next generation, Lord God, to keep his world alive, Father. But Lord, you've called us out of darkness into your marvelous light, Lord. We don't take that lightly because it's an opportunity, a great opportunity and a privilege to belong to a living God that created the heavens and the earth, Lord. You did it, Lord Jesus, for us, Lord. It was your great pleasure to do it, Lord God. But Father, you called us at this time, Lord God, to do a great work in this world. The fields are ripe, Lord God, and the harvest is plenty, Lord Jesus, but your laborers are few. You said to pray for the laborers, Lord God, in this harvest. And Lord, we lift them up today, Lord God, because many have fallen away, Lord God going after profane words and, and lying tongues, Lord God, and after dumb dogs that won't bark, Lord God. Those are pastors that don't have your heart, Lord. But Father God, they stand in pulpits, Lord God, as sheep 
but they're in wolves, they're in sheep's clothing, Lord God, but they're raving in wolves, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we ask that you bring down your fire, Lord God, upon them, Lord. Consume them, Lord God, as they spew out the lies, Lord God, on those people, Lord. And to lead them astray, Father God. Lord, you're getting wearier and wearier, Lord God, with that thing, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we're here today to declare, Lord God, your words of truth, Lord. We ask that you bring forth liberty, Lord God, in the spirit, Lord Jesus, where people can be free, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we don't look at what we see, Lord. We know, Lord God, we look at what we know, Father, and that's you, Father God. Lord, you don't vacillate, Lord God. There's no shadow of turning in you, Lord God. There's no variableness, Lord God, in you, Father. But it's you, Lord God, that stand, Lord God, forever, Lord God. Your word will stand, Father, because it's true, Lord. And Father, we thank you today for using us as your battle axes and your weapons of war, Lord, to destroy the kingdom of darkness, Lord God, to tear down his lies in the hearts of people, Lord, that they conceived as the truth, Lord God. Father God, we ask that you come against it, Lord God. Hard today, Father God. Go down deep, Lord God. Holy Spirit, have your way, Lord God. Have your way today, Holy Ghost. Have your way, Lord God, in this place, Lord, and over live stream, Lord. And everybody that comes through that door, Lord God, put your foot on it, Lord God, in the name of Jesus today, Lord God. Put your foot on every lie, Lord God, that we conceived as the truth, Lord. Where the devil has laid cockatrice eggs down in our souls, Lord. On live stream, Lord God, where folks have been under ministries, Lord God. And the devil has laid cockatrice eggs in them, Lord God. Now those eggs are beginning to birth, Lord God. Now they're turning away from revealed truth because they believe the lie, Lord God. And they won't repent, Lord Jesus. They won't return, Lord God, to you, Lord God. But Father, today, Lord God, I ask in the name of Jesus, by your mercy, Lord, that you put your foot on it today, Lord God. Destroy every lie down in the hearts of men and women of God. The devil has a plan, Lord God, to destroy them, Lord God, marvelously, Lord Jesus. But you, Lord God, have come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. We curse every devil, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Lord God, where the spirit of whoredoms are, Lord God, where there's lies and deceptions, Lord God, where there's folks, Lord God, worshiping the flesh, Lord God, won't give up the oral sex demon, Lord Jesus, but think they can serve you the way that they want to serve you. Put your foot on it today, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, and if they want to give it up, Lord, set them free, Lord. If they don't, Lord God, don't let them come here, don't even let them be a part of it, Lord Jesus. We don't have time for that, Lord God. We are your people, Lord God. We desire holiness and righteousness and to stand according to your will, Lord God. Not according to our will, Lord. And Lord, I ask today, Lord God, that you set your ministers aflame of fire today, Lord God. Pour out, Lord God, and we welcome you here today, Lord Jesus. Let us believe every word we've ever read in your Bible, Lord God. Let it purge, Lord God, purge and cleanse, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. And we have returned back to our first love, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, to set us on fire today, Lord. Give us a hunger and a thirst and a desire for righteousness, Lord. For your word, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Let the zeal of your house eat us up, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Where it takes us over, Lord God. No more us, but all of you, Father God, in the name of Jesus. No more, Lord God, no more flesh, Lord Jesus. No flesh of glory in your presence, Lord Jesus. But we call on you because we need you and we want you, Lord God. Send the rain today, Lord Jesus. Send it, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord God. We give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory, Lord God. For truly you're worthy, Lord God. You're worthy, Jesus. We will rejoice in you, Lord God, forevermore, Lord. We will thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, forevermore, Lord. Set your people a flame of fire, Lord God. Wherever we go, Lord God, they know that your presence has entered the room, Lord. Because we get before you and we worship you, Lord. We desire you, Lord God. We read your word. We pray. We fast, Lord God. Being given over to the things of God. No more the things of the flesh, Lord God. But Lord God, we love you today, Lord God, and we lift you up, Jesus. 
We want everything you got, Lord God, in your word and in your spirit that you called us to have. Anything you see down in us that's hindering that, Lord God, take it off of our necks today, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Break the yokes, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Break the yokes, Lord God, today, Father. And we lift you up, Lord God, because you alone are worthy, Father. You're worthy to be praised. And we exalt you, Lord, and we ask that you revive us again, Lord God, by the spirit of the mighty Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, we welcome you here today. Have your way and do a work in us, Lord God. Do a work, Lord God, that it will make men's ears tingle, Lord God. And we thank you for it right now, Lord. We give you all the praise, the honor, and glory. It's in Jesus' name we ask and we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, you're worthy of all adoration and praise. Glory to God in the highest. Lord, we praise you, Jesus. We thank you, our Lord, our God, and we worship you at your holy hill, Lord. We magnify your name today, Jesus. We magnify your name, Lord. We lift you up, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Lord. Father, we come before you, Lord. We've come, Lord. Pour it out, Lord Jesus, unto you. Not our wills be done, but let your will be done today, Lord. We need to be, Lord, encased in the spirit of God. We need you, Lord God, to take us over, Lord. Break these shells, Lord God. Break them, Lord God, and come in and do the work. We release our wills to you, Lord. We don't want our old stinking ways, Lord Jesus. We ask that you come and take us over, Lord. Take us over, Jesus. Take us over, Lord. Take us over, Lord. Take us over, Jesus. Take us over, Lord. Take us over, Jesus. Take us over, Lord. We need you, Lord, in these last days, Lord. We need you, Jesus. We need you, Lord. We come before you, Lord. We ask that you use us, Lord. Use us as you will, Lord Jesus. Not what we think or how we think it should be done, but the way you want it to be done, Jesus. Have your way, Lord. Speak to the mountains, Lord God, of adversity, Father. Move them out of the way, out of your children's way, Lord God, so we can come through. We'll speak to it too, Lord God. We thank you for being an intercessor for us, Lord. We thank you for helping us every day, Lord God. You've made a way out of no way, Lord God. You've made it for us. You've already cleared every path, Lord God, of adversity. And we thank you, Jesus, today. We thank you for the Holy Ghost that we can pray to you, Lord. We can commune with you, Lord Jesus. And we don't have to worry about the enemy taking it, Lord God, and then try to use it against us, Lord. But Father, we thank you, Lord God, for being a father today, Lord God, to us, Jesus. There's no father like you, Lord. There's no father like you, Lord Jesus. And we praise you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. We give you all the glory, Lord God. And we exalt your holy name, Lord. We exalt you, Lord God. We exalt your father. In the name of Jesus, sweep through this church today, Lord God. Sweep through here, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Show your people how to yield to you, Lord God. Show them how to yield to you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for it right now, Lord Jesus. Let them let loose, Lord God, and don't care how it looks, Lord. Let them let loose, Lord Jesus, to let you do what you want to do, Lord God, in us and through us, Lord. Loose us on these streets, Lord God, on these wild demoniacs. Loose us, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, as flames of fire everywhere we go, Lord God. Everywhere we go, make us into human flamethrowers, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Just burn up the landscape, Lord God, everywhere we go, Lord. Give us that fire, Lord God. We need that fire, Lord. We need it, Lord God, that cleansing fire, Lord God, that healing fire, Lord God. Bring it forth, oh, consuming fire, Lord Jesus. Consume us, Lord. Consume us, Lord. Consume us, Jesus, where there's no more flesh, Lord. No more us, Lord. Consume us, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Consume us, Lord. Consume us, Jesus. Consume us, 
Consume us, Lord. Consume your church, Lord. Consume it, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Burn up fear, Lord God. Fear, Lord God, down in the hearts of your people, Lord. They start to say, you sound like a crazy woman asking the Lord to consume you with fire. That's the only way you're going to make it out. Is that you're consumed with his Holy Ghost fire. And it's no more the flesh, but it's his spirit. That's the only way you're going to make it out and into the kingdom of God. Is that you've been a minister of righteousness and one of a flame of fire. And Father, we thank you for it today, Lord. I'm not afraid of you, Lord Jesus. Pour it in and pour it out, Lord God. Pour it in, Lord God, and pour it out, Jesus. We call on you, Lord. We call on you, Jesus. Pour it in, Lord, and pour it out, Lord Jesus. Everywhere we go, Lord, here they come. Flames of fire, Lord, we thank you, Jesus, today. We thank you, Lord. It's time, Lord. It's time, Lord. Let it go, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Flames of fire, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Run off everything that's not like you, Lord. We release ourselves to you right now, Lord. Run it off, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Run it off, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Devil, I speak to you wherever you are. In the heavenlies, we bind you in the name of Jesus. We take authority over you. You that have our children captive and bound by the spirits of the world. By the spirits of homosexuality and lesbianism. We speak to you, devil, in the name of Jesus. We command you to go. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that they are loosed right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, that they're loosed, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for doing a work in them, Lord. Bring forth the fire, Lord God. Pour it down in them, Lord Jesus. Everywhere they go, Lord God, the people know there's a flame of fire. In the name of Jesus, a liberating fire. We thank you for it, Jesus. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We bind up every devil that tries to court our children when we're not around, Lord. Pouring in lies to them, Lord God, into their minds, Lord Jesus. Telling them it don't take all of that. You can do what you want and still serve God. Devil, you're a liar and we shut your mouth. We shut your mouth and it be sealed right now in the name of Jesus. Every perverse spirit in the schools, we shut your mouth in the name of Jesus. Whether it's coming from the superintendent, the president of anything, Lord God, any board member, Lord God, any teacher, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, and most of all, any student, Father God, around our children, we command you to shut your mouth and it be sealed now in the name of Jesus. Lord, let them get tight tongue when they try to speak perverseness to our children. Not only to our children, but to us too, Lord God. That devil tries every now and then. He come trying to spew out filth, but we bind your mouth in the name of Jesus. And we command to be sealed right now in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you, Lord. I glory in you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord God, for my heavenly boxing gloves, Lord God. To beat that fool down, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. It's our turn now, Lord God, to beat him down, Lord Jesus. We know in the times to come, Lord God, he will overcome us. But, Lord God, we're going to heaven, Lord God. He's going to have to stand before us, Lord Jesus. When we see him, we're going to say, oh, man, it was that wimp that told all those lies and always coming before God accusing us. Who would be, a fear, be afraid of this foe in the name of Jesus? Lord, we stand here today, Lord God. We're asking you to pour down deep in us, Lord. That we'll come out, Lord God, knowing who we are, Lord Jesus. No matter what the situation is. But we'll boldly stand face to face with the enemy, Lord. And tell him you're a liar. In the name of Jesus, you are a liar. Everything that you're trying to do, everything that you're trying to steal, you're a liar. And we reverse it in the name of Jesus. You are a liar, and we bind you again in the name of Jesus. 
and we command you to go. We throw it you in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you for it right now. The devil is a liar. We are victorious. We belong to God. He is our Father. And Lord, we thank you today, Jesus, that we can call on you, Lord, and know that you will come forth, Father God, in the name of Jesus. We don't have to be afraid of anything, Lord God. Fearful of the night, we don't have to be afraid of darkness. Because the light dispels darkness in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you for it right now, Lord. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, that we'll push on through, Lord God. Calling on you because we can and we know that you love us, Lord Jesus. We don't have to bow down to the fear of the devil. We curse fear. Anytime folks start running around and talking a lot of stuff, it's because they become afraid of spiritual things. But Lord, we know we don't have to be afraid of you. You've already put the light in us, Lord, to dispel darkness. And Father, we thank you for it right now. We give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Sometimes you just need to walk around in your house and, and just blank darkness. Just to show the devil you're not afraid. I'm not afraid of you. This is the home that God has given me. You're not going to make me afraid of what he's given me. Just walk around in darkness. And commanding him to go. And Father, we thank you for your power, Lord, and the anointing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, how's everybody doing today? I want to wish a happy Father's Day to all the people who celebrate Father's Day. And to all the religious people not celebrating Father's Day, happy Sunday. <laughs> As you know, you got some folk that anything you do like that is always, you know, you, you're demon possessed for celebrating Father's Day. You know how it goes. That's, that's the life in church. You know, church is a volatile place. You got to be a different kind of person to come into church. Because it's all kinds of things breaking out around church. Because that's where the thrust is from the devil to stop the church. So, you know, you got to be a different kind of a person to walk through church life and deal with religious spirits. Because all this stuff is like a hodgepodge of attacks to try to stop you. But if you stay focused on the word of God for yourself, you'll make it through. Because there's a lot of winds of doctrine that blow around. There's a lot of people trying to do stuff to you, trying to accuse you, trying to stop you, trying to make you feel like you're the outsider looking in. But the word of God is an anchor that will hold in a storm. So just meditate therein day and night and you'll be safe. All right, we'll get going here before we do a few announcements to make. I always tell you about books. We're really emphasizing rules of engagement because whether we know it or not, the war is intensifying against the church. You've got to know the rules of engagement to fight a war. You can't fight a productive war without knowing the rules for engaging in the conflict or else the devil will de defeat you. I'm going to show you a, little, a quick 30-minute video by B.H. Clinton about warfare where he goes over some of the rules of engagement in his... Uh, presentation there. But one of the main things I'll tell you about rules of engagement is this. Do not try to ostracize and get out from around the fellowship of believers and the fact that the local church is the bedrock of your growth. The local church, you need to be plugged into it. Folks sitting around by way of live stream and doing all this stuff at home and all of that, that's not where you found apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to perfect you. The local church is right. You got people trying to tell folks there is no hierarchy in God and there is no ordained leadership. That's a lie because Hebrews says to obey them that have rule over you. If he told you about rule being over you, there must be some governmental authority and rulership in God's economy. When you unplug from that, you're, you're going to fall sway to all kinds of spiritual forces and every wind of doctrine blowing through. You've got to identify where the body of Christ is and then amalgamate into that body of Christ. Don't become a lone ranger. People shoot at us all the time about this. You know, they hate this because they don't want 
authority to be in place, but God has authority in place. He has a government on Jesus' shoulders. The government shall be established on his shoulders. But the Bible says Jesus descended, then he ascended, and he gave gifts to men. That's what the Bible says now. I'm not making this up. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and these are the tools used to perfect the saints. So therefore, if you try to bypass the fivefold ministry gifts assigned by Jesus to perfect you, how can you ever be perfected? You'll never be matured outside of the ordained order that Jesus Christ governs through. It's a government. God has a government. The physical governments on earth are patterned after God's government. God doesn't have a democracy. God has a monarchy. And he's a, th he's a theocrat. He's a God that rules this, this uh, kingdom. And it's a kingdom with a king. So since we're not used to monarchies and we're not used to kings, it's foreign to most Americans for sure. But you got to understand, you got to deal with a king and the king ordains his government as he, as he sees fit. You can find out where illegal governments are by reading the Bible. If he says he has qualified certain people to pastor, and then he gives you a definition of a pastor, you know anybody that does not align themselves with that definition can't be authorized by the king. It's a simple equation you have to follow now. If he says you must, if he says you must, if he says you must be the father of one wife, you must govern your home well for, to be a, a pastor, a shepherd, a deacon, a bishop, an overseer. That's just transferring the rulerships in the home to the church. So anybody outside of those paradigms, a single man, he doesn't qualify. A woman does not qualify. This is Bible 101. Now the carnal mind makes adjustments whenever God says something and tries to disengage and make God's word, word null and void based on how they feel about it. You can't feel about the word of God. The word of God is not given to feel about it. The word of God is given to obey it. See, I can't intrude upon God's word with my feelings. I don't feel like, I don't think, from my point of view, in my opinion, all of that garbage is just null and void in the kingdom of God. You don't feel about the word of God, you obey it. And everybody that does not obey it won't make it in. Obedience is better than sacrifice. We're called to the obedience of faith, which is the obedience because you believe. You believe, therefore you obey. If you bypass that, you won't make it. It's a simple thing. Just read that Bible. Anything outside of the confines of that Bible, don't feel about it. Don't think about it. Know that it's wrong. I don't care if it's your mother-in-law. I don't care if it's your sister. I don't care if it's your aunt, your mama. If she's trying to pastor a church, she's out of order according to 1 Timothy chapter 3 in the book of Titus. Don't feel about them. Don't you get involved with it. You see what I'm saying? No matter how much they try to enlist you, according to the Bible, I can't join this because the Bible disqualifies you from what you're trying to do. You can't make it to heaven trying to feel now. Remember, feelings are Satan's doorway to your soul, your emotions. You got to, first of all, deaden those things and have God resurrect your emotions so you feel like God feels about things. See, human feelings can totally deceive you. You let that die and let God resurrect how he feels about things. That'll keep you safe in the middle of what we're going into because we're going into a severe storm now and everything we thought was make-believe is now coming to fruition. Everything we thought would never happen is happening. You know what I'm saying? It's already a past tense thing. We're looking at things on this planet that you never thought would happen down here. And this stuff is coming to fruition. And so the church is basically being pruned back by God. And he's basically narrowing it down, the scope of it, so he can deal with a select, elect, chosen group of people at the end. So don't look for the masses to come to it. It's going to be a lean, mean fighting machine. It's going to be ordered, going to be disciplined, and it's going to be able to totally ignore outside forces that try to influence us. You'll ignore them. 
and nothing makes a Jezebel or Ahab spirit matter than to be ignored. They really get mad. Then they begin to fume at you. Remember how the Pharisees and Sadducees went about to kill Jesus? Jesus said, you, you're walking around thinking about killing me. He says, you're crazy. You're demon possessed. Nobody wants to kill you. And back in the back room making plans to kill him. That's the devil one-on-one. Jesus could see them and say, you're, you're planning to kill me. You're crazy. That's, the, that's what we're looking at right now in American politics. All these lies they tell all day. They tell lies all day on CNN and all these different mediums. It's just a bunch of liars with no conscience. They'll make up lies and then put it out there and propagate the lies. And what they're banking on is this. We've dumbed you down enough in the public schools that we can tell you anything and you'll be stupid enough to believe it. That's what they're banking on. So that's why you got to separate from them. Get in the Bible. Get back to reading and meditating on your Bible because that's going to be your safeguard. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Your, that word is lighting up your pathways. You can't see without the Bible. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Get in the Bible. Stay there. Meditate in the Bible. Take you some time every day to get in the Bible. I mean, get you some time, man. Read that Bible. Meditate on that Bible. Some of us have the Bible programmed in that you can meditate on what store. You can call it up into your mind from, from, your, from your heart. And you can run scripture through your head because it's programmed into you. But meditate on it. Chew on it. The word meditation in the Bible is the same word for a cow chewing its cud. See, what a cow does, it eats grass and hay, digest it, but it has the ability to regurgitate it and chew on it. When you see a cow in the field just chewing, he's chewing cud, which is regurgitated food that it, that it ate. He regurgitates it back in the mouth and he chews it to get all the nutrients out of it. He keeps breaking it up to get all the nutrition out of it. So the word of God is so expansive, you know you can read 20 scriptures and see 20 different things in it. Because the Holy Ghost illuminated it another way that it applied to you. You can read a, a certain scripture in a certain circumstance and then another circumstance occurs and the same scripture will speak to you another way. This thing here, man, is a dynamic thing with God's mind operating through it because the Holy Ghost gives life to the word and applies that word where necessary. That's why you got to keep meditating on it. Nothing looks like what it is. I'll say that again. Remembering life that nothing looks like what it is. The last will be first, and the first will be last. The people you think are going down, they're really going up. If you see a person becoming debased and cast down, that means God is elevating them. And But you look at them, that show is pitiful, man. You're going through hell. No, it's going up higher. So don't ever evaluate things with your eyes because God debases you first, he lowers you first and gets all of the pride and the flesh out of you so that when he elevates you in the natural, you'll be dead. <laughs> See, because he, he can't trust us with supernatural power. And we got a bunch of flesh because you'll be killing people and stuff like that with supernatural power. Somebody says something, you just strike them dead and stuff like that. I believe Elijah got in trouble when those two boys called him bald-headed. And what did he do? He called, he called bears on them boys to tear those, tear those boys. All because they were just joning him. Go up, you bald-headed man. He said, you just don't know who I am, do you? And cursed him, and bears jumped those two little boys. So you got to be careful with supernatural power. God, the gifts and calls of God are without repentance. So God does not dole out. God's got supernatural power now. But he doesn't just dole it out in a, in a cavalier fashion because how crazy we are. So he got to break us on down, down to the ground, lower than the ground. And then he can give you what he wants to give you and you won't get back up again. Because, you know, you can't walk around proud in this because the devil can trigger you. And, you know, you can kill half of a city with God's power on display. You can't, you can't, he can't trust that kind of power into the hands of somebody that's crazy. I mean, this is real power. Now, this is real dynamic Holy Ghost power that can destroy heal, deliver, and set free. So you've got to know when, where, and what God is doing. And the only way you can stay, you know, just balanced enough is to let God, first of all, eliminate that flesh. And you're not responsive to everybody. 
Because people will spit in your face. And they spit in your face, you full of the Holy Ghost. It's a whole lot of folk can get, you know, get taken care of real fast. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, because, see, they spat on Jesus. They cursed him. and he didn't, he didn't open his mouth. But he was full of power. Now, Jesus didn't let go of power being crucified now. He, said he opened out his mouth for a reason, not for his sake, but for their sakes. He said, don't you know, I can call to my father. He'll send legions of angels down. He'll destroy everything within 30 miles of here. That's why he had to stay quiet, because if he talked, Everybody around him was damned. That guy that slapped him, his hand would have rotted off the end of his wrist if he had to talk. So it's a blessed thing when Jesus doesn't talk sometimes because if he talks, things begin to happen. Remember, he spoke this whole world into existence. That's a lot of power. So he is very slow to speak. Jesus does not talk a lot because if he starts talking, things go into immediate, it's an immediate response. Now, ram of words, Things begin to jump off. So don't, you, don't be too hasty telling Jesus to answer me, Lord. I mean, because if he answers you, a whole lot of stuff might jump off real fast. We got to get ready for the answer. Because when he begins to move, it's going to be so different from what we expected that your mind will have to be recalibrated to actually put up with what he's going to do. That's why don't be so quick to start jumping around with the Lord because the Lord got real Power. He speaks worlds into existence, universes, galaxies, solar systems, suns. The sun is huge. And look how much heat it puts out. It was 112 degrees, I think, the other day in Phoenix. And the it, sun just hanging there. And man, that's a lot of heat for it to be as far away as it is from us and can burn your butt to a crisp way down here. <laughs> you know, little light-skinned black girl like... Uh, Shonda, man, she come out there all red, <laughs> burn all up, you know. Every other black boy turn blacker. You got red. <laughs> See, that's what happens, though, because the sun is a sign of the kind of power God has. And notice how the universe and all the planets revolve around the sun. The sun does not revolve around the universe. So everybody revolves around Jesus, but you don't let Jesus don't revolve around us. So we got to change. For real. So rules of engagement. Learn the rules. Don't get out here in this thing helter skelter in a little, you know, tiptoe through the tulip cavalier fashion. Some of the chapter titles here. Let's see in rules of engagement by Derek Prince available on Amazon.com. Our struggle with obedience. Who will qualify? Requirements for God's army. Finding inner harmony. So you've got to have inner harmony for God to move through you. Did you know that? You cannot be chaotic inside and have God move through you. God moves through harmony. So that means spirit, soul, and body has to harmonize. So you can't have a bunch of soul ties with somebody else and expect God to move through you because you got dysfunctions inside of you. You got to get harmony, spirit, soul, and body so you're all on one page so God can flow from your spirit through your soul and out of you with no disharmony. If it's disharmony, he can't move. If it's disharmony in the church, he can't move. You got to have one mind, one faith, one baptism. They all came together on one accord. That's why the devil tries to sow what into a church? Discord. He wants all kinds of animosity and stuff between the people. So God won't move. God does not move through disharmony. So he says finding inner harmony, testing versus chastening. See, you can be tested by God. Then you can be chastened by God. You're chasing when you're disobedient. You're testing when he's forging you into a new kind of a creature. So you got to understand testing versus chastening. The hardest test of all, denying the old man, the role of worship. You know, worship is a, spot, is a part of the rules of engagement in a war. <coughs> Victory in praise. Know your guide, referring to the whole, this, is, this, this uh, session is called Holy, Holy Spirit Training. The first session was called Building a, a Soldier's Character. The second section is called Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit Training. Know your guide, letting the Holy Spirit lead. No place for hypocrisy. The Holy Spirit and the Word, taking up the spiritual gifts, developing spiritual fruit. The third section is called Battle in the Heavenlies, understanding our enemy, the spirit of Antichrist, angelic intervention in human lives, warfare in heavenly places, 
principles of spiritual protection, the weapons of our warfare, and the climax of the conflict, the last section is called Enduring to the End. Humanism, forerunner for the Antichrist. You know, they've been teaching humanism for the last 50 years. That's in preparation for the Antichrist. What does it do? It teaches people that the sum total of your deliverance and your dependence rests in the arms of human beings. That's humanism. In other words, a human is your answer. Because the devil is formatting people to expect a human being to come to solve all the problems and that human being will be the Antichrist. So people get involved in pastor worship. The president is the answer. Trump is our man. See, Obama is the savior. See, it's humanism being taught to people so that when the Antichrist comes, they'll believe a human character is going to solve our problems. He's brainwashing people to expect a human to do it. So he says, humanism, forerunner for the Antichrist. Will Satan ever be reconciled to God? The answer to that, standing here, is no. That's a short chapter. <laughs> Opposition to Jesus' return. That's what we're picking up right now. You know what's happening? Folks are afraid this message we preach will actually happen. In other words, if we keep saying what we're saying, they're, they're afraid that people might amalgamate on this. God will supercharge the church in the world, and they get afraid because of what? I'm not ready. I know instinctively I'm not ready for the world to end, so I try to delay and try to thwart anybody that's, that's changing to get ready. I'm personally not ready, so I'm trying to hold Jesus back from coming. So I think if I make you all stop all of this, he won't come and get you because you won't be ready easy either. Guess what? You're making a bad mistake because there are people who are getting ready in spite of anybody else interfering with them. So that fear it is what makes them oppose Jesus. So he has a whole chapter on opposing Jesus' return. Learning from Balaam's mistakes. Now if you remember Balaam, what he did, you know, he went out there trying to get some money, trying to Bless a curse folk for this foreign tribe. Preparing to reign with Christ. Character that stands the test. The quest for character and finishing the course. Rules of engagement. This is a good book. Get a copy of it. Read it. Because you got to be prepared before God engages. Remember the church hasn't even engaged the enemy yet. This is all preparation. When he begins to move. The environmental changes will be so dramatic that you won't be able to ride this one out because it will be nothing like what you imagined. You got to be changed now for then. Don't wait. Don't delay. Get in now while you got time to change. Rules of Engagement, Derek Prince, Amazon.com. Get a copy of that book. It'll help you. Matter of fact, we talked about today a ground war and an air war. There are two wars being fought. A ground war and an air war, we're going to try to show you the dif difference between the two and how one must be fought before the other one can launch. You got to win the air war first before the ground war can actually be put into effect. Every military unit I've ever seen in the military, they always saturation bomb the environment first before the ground troops go in because you weaken defenses through your bombing campaign first. And then you send in the ground troops. So we got to fight an air war and a ground war. And we'll look at that today in this message. Next thing, remember that we're still on the prayer line every night, 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, there's a few people carrying the load of prayer while other people sit around looking. Prayer warriors are needed to combat the devil and keep pounding the heavenlies. This is the air war. So we need enlist, enlistees to actually take on the responsibility of engaging the enemy in the atmosphere. That's the air war, and it comes by way of prayer. So that's available every night. That number is 641-715-3670. 641-715-3670, and the access code is 409367. 409-367, the prayer line, every night, Monday through Sunday night. Next thing, remember Dunamis Tabernacle, our answer on the physical plane to initiate the ground war is a base camp. 
Military units need a base camp. Logistics, supplies, everything you need at a base camp. Omar was telling me he talked to a lady down in the lobby just then. She wanted to come to the church service, but she works five days a week, and she works two days here at the hotel as a desk clerk. And she can't find a way to go to church on Sunday. So a 24-hour day operation is available for that. See, our plan is a church that never closes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to accommodate all the different shift workers and people who, have, who, don't, who are not around on Sunday because they're working. Church should never close. God never slumbers, he never sleeps. Why is the church closed? If God doesn't sleep, why is the church asleep? I mean, why do you build a church and shut it down five days a week? That's crazy. Some of these folk got 20 and 30 million dollar investments and the thing is closed down five days a week. Walmart doesn't even do that. Why is the church closed down? The church should be a constant, active base camp, always thriving, prayer always being wrought, prayer rooms always available, always something going on, always alive and thriving. God doesn't slumber or sleep, the church never should. Dunamis Tabernacle answers that. Dunamis Tabernacle designed to be a citadel and a refuge away from all the calamity on this earth right now. This place is full of chaos and calamity. We need a sanctified arena for God's presence to rest so that saints can take on fuel and fight a productive warfare. Support Dunamis Tabernacle at www.omegaministries.org. Click on support, then donate. I say that, I get all kinds of hate mail and stuff like that. For, you know. Why are you trying to promote some kind of a brick and mortar building when we are the body of Christ and we don't need brick and mortar to... There's some crazy folk down here. Real crazy. You say somebody today, where are they going to go to get taught? The same person complaining about brick and mortar would never teach a person. They're not going to do anything to help them and still complain about whatever is done to help people. I'm going to tell you the worst person on earth the person that tries to fight whatever the church does and yet won't do anything themselves about anything. But anything that you do, they'll fight it. But they have no way of helping anybody themselves. It's like a person that says, why does the church take up an offering when there are poor people in our midst? We should be helping the poor. Well, anybody that was, that was not insane would realize you need an ordered structure to help the poor. You need some kind of a systemic plan to help the poor. You know why? Because if you begin to help the poor generically, it's going to be a lot of con men and people who are not poor coming in to take your stuff. What am I basing that on? The book of Acts. The widows are not being cared for, the Gentiles said. They didn't go running around trying to help the widows. Select seven Holy Ghost filled men. Get these deacons set in place so they can filter through those that are actually authentic and disregard the fake and phony people. You cannot govern and administrate anything without some type of a format and structure to do it because you're going to have a bunch of crazy folk, not even saved, just want to live off of the church. They'll pimp the church unless you've got structure in place to administrate it. So all these harebrained, helter-skelter people not knowing what's going on, always trying to give some type of advice, especially on stupid Facebook, when they know nothing about the church and need to sit down, shut up, and get taught this thing. Because I know what I'm doing. You got to have structure, you got to have men in responsible places supported by women who have come into a union with them to undergird them. Women undergird the men and they walk with them. It's not about being dominant over women. Everybody's walking together and working together on one accord. But it's nothing worse than some kind of a rebel and renegade trying to tell you about church, all the while an antichrist spirit hating the church. Don't fall prey to this trash because it's everywhere. And I don't take a lot of time to mention it because I don't deal with them. I deal with the true body of Christ and people that mean business. 
But I'm telling you, those spirits out there pray on the newborn babes. See, they're after the babes in Christ. See, a lot of y'all mature enough to know that's a kook. But the babes don't know. And if they do anything to defile and harm those babes in Christ, it would be better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and be thrown into the Atlantic Ocean, the Bible says. So here you are, defiling and, de and deceiving the babes in Christ that don't know as they come through the front door with your harebrained, idiotic garbage. Sit down, shut your mouth, let me warn you before God comes to see you. This is nowhere to play. This is nowhere for a novice. This is nowhere for your theories and your opinions. You better know what you're dealing with and who you're dealing with here. God is going to establish his church just like the book of Acts. And he's going to process and then project a force into the earth to bring in a harvest. Don't get in his way because if he rises up, his enemies are scattered. Let God arise and his enemies will be scattered. Don't find yourself fighting God at the most inopportune time. I warn people, but you can't make them change. You can lead a horse to water all day long, but you can't make one drink. They're praying on the babes in Christ. The innocent ones who don't know. There's nothing more innocent than a newborn babe because a newborn babe is looking for somebody to take care of them because they are totally what? <laughs> Dependent and helpless. I don't know. And they take for granted when they walk in church that you know. Without even knowing you, you might have just got saved yesterday. But if you walk in here today, you figure the people here know more than you. And they listen to you. And boy, the devil is always trying to do what? Sift them. That's why they got to be under tutors and governors that can watch out for their souls and warn them. It's a lot of people I warn behind the scenes that people don't, will never know about. It. I'll tell them, beware of this person because they've gone off the deep end. Cut them. Cut them. Keep yourself pure, Timothy. Cut them. Follow God-ordained leadership. That makes them furious because now you're saying, I'm not equal to you. You know what I'm saying? You're not equal to me. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> it's the way it is. Don't let there be many teachers amongst you because they'll receive what? The greater condemnation. You don't want to step into this man helter-skelter. Because there's a lot of responsibility over here. You start opening your mouth on Facebook trying to teach people. You better know every word you say, God is writing it down. And you better be right. Don't fool around with things and think that there's something to play with over here. Because God is always doing something, but it doesn't look like he's doing anything. That's the mystery of God. He's always up to something, but your senses can't pick him up. Don't play with God. Not right now because one thing, he's angry. It's a fearful thing to, to fall into the hands of an angry God. He's already mad. And here you come with stupidity. You are adding fuel to the fire. Leave things alone. Just sit down. If you, if you don't like it, at least shut your mouth and just go on about your business somewhere now. Because you don't want to be found fighting God, thinking you're doing God a service. Because they're going to kill us thinking they're serving God. Be ready. I'm t that's the Bible 101. I take time to warn folks. I don't do it often. But hey, we're moving down the, down the track and we can't be stopped now because we're too late in the day. Dunamis Tabernacle supported. The vision is plain. Go to YouTube, 29 minute presentation on the whole outlay whole structure, whole hierarchy in the church set up as 12 elders, 24 deacons, 20, uh, four, uh, 48 assistant deacons to govern the body of Christ as it expands so everybody's needs will be met. We're not here to take money upstream to, to get a Bentley or a Gulfstream aircraft. We're here to have the money put out there to help the folks as God sees fit, but you gotta have ordained structure and administrators in place, men of God as a foundation to govern this thing and everything falls in place after that. It's the way it has to work. Jesus did it. 
Jacob did it with his lineage. Then Jesus came with 12 apostles and did the same thing. That's the government of God. That number 12 establishes the government of God. It's the way it has to work. Don't try to fix the wheel because God already made the wheel. You just get in the car and let the wheel carry you down the street because you can't fix that which is perfect. Dunamis Tabernacle, support it. The first of its kind, I believe, a 24 hour a day place that's really established as a base camp, a military structure for the militant saints that are conducting a productive warfare. I was talking to a, 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 a lady the other week that's a doctor. She said, in my church, my church has established a health facility man with doctors, nurses, and specialists for the care of the saints. I said, man, I had them on the drawing board a long time ago. Why we keep talking about health care and Obamacare and now Trump care when you got a church of 15,000 folks that can get a doctor and a clinic on site to take care of every need for the whole church. And the offerings are doing it. You're paying the doctors and their staff. You don't even have to go to the world for anything. We should be a self-contained organic functioning family of God not needing the world for anything think about what I'm saying these guys can take in at these big churches upwards of five million dollars a week on a, with an offering why are we talking about health care as the saints gynecologists specialists radiologists that's sitting right there on the church campus right there to, to, to take care of the saints and the offerings are fueling all of that. You walk in there not paying a nickel because your offerings have already sustained the finances for the health care. care. Man, this thing is, man, this thing in my mind is so simple. It's almost laughable. If you got 10 barbers that go to the church, then hey, these guys could have a facility to cut hair on the campus, man. Just go get a haircut, pay the guy, and, and you sustain in the barbers. And you got your nappy head cut. <laughs> Hairstylist, dentist, whatever. I mean, a 15, these people talk about 15,000 members, 30,000 members. Out there with, at, at uh, Joel Osteen and, and, and Lakewood, 40 some thousand members. Why is anybody in here looking to the world to do anything? This is, man, this is almost insanity, man. But what happens? I got a $10 million mansion. I got a Gulfstream aircraft that costs $65 million, a brand new Bentley for $425,000. I'm in front of you shining, talking about faith and what God is doing for me, following that paradigm that came through Jerry Savelle and Kenneth Copeland, all these boys filthy rich, living in complexes. I mean, you're talking about, they look, their house look like a Marriott hotel. Talking about God's faith. Man, and look, how much money would it really take for you to live? I mean, you know what I'm saying? If you made $100,000 a year, you could live forever down here and just die and go to glory. Some of these guys worth $200 million. That's crazy. This is not rocket science. Then we began to change the environment by preaching another message like I'm doing right now. And the people begin to fight us. What you fighting me for? What you fighting Omega for? I'm trying to tell you a plan to get the thing redistributed and done the right way. But yeah, you found the same. How do you know it's the same? That's crazy. People write me letters, man, are just, just insane. I don't even know what they're talking about. Okay, first of all, we're just a few people in the hotel room. Why are you fighting me? Why don't you go over there and fight some big megaplex somewhere that's doing the wrong stuff because they're afraid of this because they know it sounds, it sounds like it's right. This might jump off. What, if they do this, I'm not ready. So I live my life doing what? Fighting ministries. Fighting anything anybody does because I'm not ready to go anyway. I got family members not saved. My husband, my wife is not saved. My father, my mother's not saved. My grandmama's a Roman Catholic. If this jumps off, my, mom, my grandmama will be lost. We can't do anything about that. It's time for the body of Christ to congeal and come together, form up, 
that body that is a self-sustaining dynamo and do the work of the ministry. They established base camps in the Acts. They all came together, had all things coming, and no one lacked. That's what the Bible says. You can't even get to that because all these lone rangers and renegades fight anything you do. We can't even get the structure up and running until God builds the house or else we'll be laboring in vain. God will have to come by his spirit and take one by a city, two from over here, people he's actually forced to see this thing, having abstract minds to walk it out so he won't have to wrestle with them. We can't wrestle with religious minds anymore. They're concrete thinkers. We gotta have abstract, loose minds in this, people who are free from all the concretes of life to see the big picture. You can't explain this to a concrete religious mind because they, they always harp on what? Negativity. Remember this about a religious spirit. It's always set on negative. It can't see anything positive. It's gonna look for the wrong. And the Bible says to the pure, all things are pure. You don't look for the wrong because you got a pure heart. Well, I'm just discerning. No, you ain't discerning. You're just a dirty dog. That's all that is. <laughs> look, it's time for the body of Christ to unify under the banner of Jesus Christ. Come together and we take care of our folks because we're separated from that filthy world trying to undermine all of us. Still on the same page. Junimus Tabernacle. OmegaMinus.org. Click on support, then donate. It's time to get out of here. All right. I think that's going to wrap up all the announcements for this Sunday. I'm going to take up a quick offering if you give it by way of live stream. Again, you can go to omegaministry.org, click on support, then donate. Doing Miss Tabernacle, still $104,000. Trying to get to a million dollars to buy the facility, set up a miniature base camp that will expand as the people expand. You know, a foundation expands as the people expand. It's always geometric. One location, this location we're looking at now, will seat about 700 people. That could expand to 7,000 people in a few months. So you gotta have a plan in place to tolerate the expansion. Cause God does not do little things. Look around the world, you think God is a little-minded God? All these mountain ranges and stuff. You know, there are mountains under the ocean that are up to 10,000 feet in height. As high as the Himalayas. Who knows how deep the ocean is? The Bible talks about the abyss. Man, who, who actually knows how deep the ocean is? They've sent things down into the ocean. This fish down there that will scare you. I mean, ugly, rusty looking stuff. You go deeper. You know, you might run into Leviathan down there. You know, Leviathan, Leviathan come, comes out of the deep. I don't really want to know what's down there. So don't think of God as this little narrow-minded, teeny-weeny, itsy-bitsy, polka-dot bikini kind of a God. God thinks big thoughts. Let your mind expand. You should be thinking about doing big things in life, not this little old drawn-up, narrow-minded junk. Man, expand your mind. Experience some things. Do some things. Go somewhere and, and live. Get in touch with a big-minded God so your mind will become like his. So we're taking up this quick offering, getting into the word after this, talking about an air war and a ground war. OmegaMinistry.org. Give and support the mi mission. Go to YouTube. Look at the 29-minute presentation. It's called Dunamis Tabernacle. Get a... Real look at the vision and where we're going. This is not helter skelter. We can't. We follow a plan. It's not a helter skelter, hit or miss type deal. You've got to have organized planning, structured minds, and people that can administrate and manage things in place. That's what it's all about. We're not fighting a war as one that beats against the air. The Bible says, "You've got to have order." Let's take up this quick offering and we get into the word for today, and we'll appreciate you. All right, get the word for today. Y'all remember to pray for Tim Tim as he is waiting on this departure date for the Air Force. We want to see our young people advance and take on life and do some things, you know, not just sit around. There's too many people dead heading it out here, man. They coming out of high school and they're somewhere flipping burgers for the next 10 years, not knowing what to do. You've got to get a plan. 
And one of the things we want to do through doing the Mistap now is establish a planning center for young people coming out of high school. You know, we should have the resources in place to handle scholarships for these kids. Like I said, again, a 15,000 member church and your kids suffering to go to college? That's crazy. I don't understand any of this, how this is happening with all these folk going to church and folk just suffering, just, just barely making it. You know, church is designed to be a place where the rich meet the poor and they come together and it, it becomes a place of unity and you get an amalgamation of all these resources and thinking minds to plan out things. You got, you got a lot of uh, potential intellect and a lot of smart folks sitting around not being tapped into. That doesn't make sense. We got every skill bank you can name in the world. And this is what's happening in church. Everybody in church leaves church and gives all of their skills to the world and comes to church to, to, to dance to the feet start smoking. And then going all their resources given to the world and come and just get their feet smoking every Sunday. Just. <laughs> and then go to the world and sit in the IBM computer thinking for IBM and IBM is tapping into all their mental faculties and IBM is becoming a billion dollar corporation and the church is living in that's crazy. This is brainwashing. Church should not be intellectual. Church should be entertainment and emotion based. We got to get, man, we got to start thinking. Thinking, man, it's a lot of things that could be going on if we could get back to thinking people again. Stop making church a bastion of emotionalism and bring your mind to church too. Don't leave your mind in the car and come in and just want to get your feet smoking. Breaking your stilettos up and everything. Broke your stiletto heels off and everything. Just look. And we'll go right to work tomorrow morning. All of that mental acumen is put into the job. And then you come to church for emotionalism. We've got to, basically, you got to know what you got to do. Deprogram people. They've been brainwashed by the world. And they see church and they compartmentalize church to be a certain thing, and this is what you act like in church, but you don't act like this anywhere else but church, now you take your mental abilities and your education and your degree to the world for them to use you. We gotta break that down, man. That's crazy. So let's, let's look at this, ground war, air war. Part of the ground war is to deliver people's minds from what I just described, that's part of the ground war. But let's listen to uh, Burt Clinton and as he talks about spiritual warfare, and then we'll get into the message for today, which is all about a ground war and an air war. Corinthians chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to just turn over there. I want to read this to you. Verses uh, 3 and 4. For although we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 1 Timothy 1, 18 and the eighth part of 19 said, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went on, went before on thee, that thou mightest war a good warfare, hold in faith and a good conscience. Revelation chapter 12, we read, The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6, the first part says, It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. You know, victory that has been won but must be enforced in the life of every believer, that victory over the devil and his forces should be the desire of every Christian. Wherever, whatever we are, 
is to overcome in the areas where Christ has already brought that victory about. The greatest speech makers, the richest people, the highest politician, the largest industries, biggest political machine, mightiest army in the sum and total, powerful forces known to mankind, put all together as bowed, as efficient as toothpicks against saints or, or tanks, as it is for people or anything besides God to war against the enemy. Nothing is effective except the weapons that have been given us as the people of God. Carnal weapons are useless against the enemy and the foe that we find ourselves against. You may try, and the church certainly has, psychology, emotions. We've watched all the calisthenics of religion. I know that when a man, when a woman is touched of God, they act strangely sometimes. But just to get them to act strangely won't do a thing for anybody. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. We can try, uh, we can try psychology, emotions, knowledge, programs, promotion, aggressive visitation, activities, super bus ministries, personalities, advertising, manipulation, stunts, contests, hair phone books and two, food, bribery, carnal acts, but God guarantees their failure. I said God guarantees their failure. Everything and anything is guaranteed against anything but divine fire. Unless we move and walk in the Holy Spirit, then we're going to be victimized by the very enemy that we claim to have the victory over. We must learn to do God's work in God's way. He's given us the much needed weapons. I read to you in 2 Corinthians. Possession of such weapons, though, is not enough. We have them if we're filled and birthed of the Holy Spirit. We have these weapons. But just the possession of them is not enough. Knowledge of how to use them will win no battles. Just the fact that you've got it in your head won't win a battle against the devil. We must use these weapons to pull down the strongholds of the devil. Amen. To know about them, to have them in our possession, will do nothing. It's only as the church enters in to the warfare set before, using the weapons of this warfare to pull down the strongholds of the devil. We're not to emphasize the weak points of the opposition. We're to attack him where he's the strongest. It is here that God is saying. We're not trying to go around or outflank him. He must be not only defeated, but destroyed. So many times the church in her effort is trying to sneak past the devil, outflank him. Oh no, we're not to slip up behind him. We're to face him head on in the power of the living God. I give you power over all the power of the devil. Must be the marching army. We must not emphasize the weak points. After victory, we're not only just to defeat him, we're to dismantle his place of power and leave him no place for the future. Wherever we claim, we claim for keeps. I was born again 40 years ago on the 21st day of this month. God, I became the property of God. I, I, it is not the will of God that the devil should ever use this vessel again. You hear me? I said it's not the will of God. When we claim a territory for God, it is the purpose of God that we stand on that place. Dismantle the forces of hell. Destroy everything that looks for him. Put out everything that suggests him. We are more than conquerors. We're not going to produce the millennium, folks. No, so Jesus is going to do that. I can tell you in our lives, our family, our church, the devil's to be under our feet. We're to walk on him. We are more than conquerors in the nation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What are strongholds that we're to pull down? Places, situations, and people where, humanly speaking, it would be appear impossible for God to work. Strong habits, great problems, rebellious cold hearts, dead churches, devil-controlled territory, or any area that makes weak back, lazy believers give up and say it can't be done. It is the purpose of God 
that we pull down these strongholds. The very people that you say can't be saved are the people that are going to make the greatest in the kingdom of God. We're not as wise as God. We must recognize there's nothing impossible with God. And it's those places that look impossible that God is saying to us, pull them down. I said, pull them down. I've found people who talk religion at the drop of a hat, but they'll never give themselves to God. It is these strongholds. Take courage. God says, all things are possible to Him that believeth. We need to win a victory. Pull down a stronghold. Let, let the devil know that we mean business with God. Now our various, our, our weapons are various, but they're all related. All of them. You take in human warfare, different weapons are used for different needs. I was in, in one war, World War number two. We, we used bazookas for tanks. We used rifles, hand grenades for people. Now we got missiles for airplanes, submarines for battleships. In other words, we didn't pull a submarine up on shore to try to get a sniper out of a tree. Amen. We used the weapons. In, in, in accord with the need. God has given us various weapons. They are all related. Jesus, our commander, can give direction through the Holy Spirit according to His sovereign desire. Some situation uh, will be obvious, Scripture. Others He'll direct. But the weapons that we use are, the, are going to determine the victory. We're up against things. We're up against places. We're up against peoples. We're up against strongholds. But there's nothing in front of me that I cannot handle if I belong to God. Nothing. There's no problem. This church and its people cannot overcome if we recognize what God has given us. I want to deal with these weapons for a little while this morning. I want God to arrest your mind. I can tell you as we move toward the end of this age, we're, we're seeing this new age theology come into the church and the Christ. Has, and His doctrine is becoming the doctrine of the Christian church. The kingdom now theology uh, and the domin kingdom now dominion says uh, to, in no uncertain terms that we are the ongoing incarnation of Christ. Not talking about being a partaker of His divine nature. But going into the Eastern cult of reincarnation. Now, when you consider that the unity movement that lies in itself under charismatic and Pentecost today has its roots in that kind of a situation. Evolution being the very key stone to it all. Moving beyond the, the evolution that we're talking about in the schools, and that'll be changed pretty rapidly. Uh, it'll be more of a conscious revolution that's taking place in evolution. But what I want to say to you, we're up against things. That reincarnation uh, of the Hindu is the reason there are no victims. They say that the karma, that's yourself. When it dies, it comes back. Maybe in a toad frog or something else. We've updated that in America. Well, Shirley MacLaine has made it just human. We come back always in human form. But you see what they say in that. I, I'm dealing with the devil and, and the weapons to be used against him. They, they say that whatever you come back, a Hitler may come back as a frog to pay for his past sin, to overcome his karma. That's the reason in India when you see one of a caste system born and bred and dying on the street with nothing to eat. They have no care for him. They don't attempt to feed him. They say there's no victims. In America you have that witch that has the Chandler that allows that 35,000 uh, year old spirit to talk to her. Ramtha they call it. She says murder is not wrong when you recognize the situation of reincarnation. You're just going to come back in a better form, it'll be higher. What am I saying? I'm saying that that kingdom now theology has embraced that 
not in that extreme, but hear me at will, because they're saying that the enemy, the radical, is a fundamental Bible-believing Christian that has to be done away. All I'm telling you, church, we're going to deal with the devil or he's going to deal with us. We're going to face up to what we're against in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ using the weapons given us or else we're going to face him with every weapon he has. Looking at these weapons, prayer is the first one I want to mention, but nothing else is worthwhile without that. I don't care how high you kick your heels. It doesn't matter whatever else you do. If yours is not prayer, if there's not prayer room in that life, then you are victimized. The Bible said you will pray or you will faint. This weapon has a multitude of uses. Prayer. It, it is so simple that a, ya, a child may use it, yet so deep that the greatest saint has never mastered it. Amen. A child can pray. But the greatest saint ever lived on this earth has never mastered this one weapon of prayer. It's, it is the most difficult to sell to a sleeping church because nothing else, no gifts, no nothing operate until that, that weapon is in place in the church. I just want to bring to you some of the following use of this. I can't tarry long, but, but you, you can just... Hang on to what I've got to say. Fasting, Matthew and Mark, all the way through. You see in Matthew 9, Matthew 17, Mark 9, 29, we see this tool of fasting with prayer. Amen. What is a lost art in the church of our time. No wonder the flesh has become such a prevalent thing in the church because the one weapon God has given to deal with that flesh is, is fasting. He said in Mark 9, 29, This kind come forth by nothing but by prayer and by fasting. When I pray, I lift up that man of God. When I fast, I put down that sinful nature. It is here. Listen, that's the weapon. If I walk in the Spirit, then the devil recognizes things. If I walk in the flesh, I'm victimized. Fasting. Number two, asking. James 4 and 2 says, You have not because you ask not. Supplication and fellowship. Ephesians 6 and 18 talks about the supplication of prayer. Number four, claiming the lost souls. Psalms 2 and 8 says, Ask of me and I'll give you the heathen. We, we may pass in a card for a loved one, but there has to come a burden. Listen, folks, I can tell you here now that the problem is on our side, not God's. He's made every provision. When Zion travails, sons and daughters, that's your sons, that's your daughters, will be born if you'll spend time with God. Scriptural arguments, Job 23, 3 and 4. Come out of it when he prayed for his friend. Binding and loosing. Amen. I'm talking about this weapon of prayer in Matthew 18, 18 and 19. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is the awesome business of prayer, folks. My God, if I could stir your heart this morning. Amen. If I could move your mind to the reality. And I don't care whatever else. You can go around prophesying. But it's like dry peas hitting a buckeye. If you haven't spent some time before God Almighty, then what you're doing is anointed. We've got so much pouring off the top of the head. We have all kinds of substitutes for Jesus out there in this hour. What we need is return to that altar, humble ourselves before God, wait upon Him till the anointing comes. Then we are affected. Prayer in number eight, Jesus' name. What a weapon to be used in prayer. Amen. The name of Jesus. You know the blood, the cross, and the name of Jesus are specific weapons. The blood is a territory. As I stand on that territory secured by the blood, I can tell you there's no way the devil can touch that. Amen. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, Stand on that ground secured by the blood with the cross crucified. That old man, you can hurl the name of Jesus out across the waves. All hell has to bow its knee. Yeah. 
believe in faith. Mark 11, Romans 10, Hebrews 11. Amen. Whatsoever you ask in my name, believe in, it will be done. That is what we're talking. Spirit intercession. Romans 8, 26. We yield ourselves to God. Then the Holy Spirit prays through us about things that we don't even know about. Oh, what, what opportunity. As I begin in the, in, the, in the natural, progress to the spiritual, so that the Holy Spirit can begin to pray through me. There'll be intercession made for things that I don't know anything about. There's strongholds that I don't recognize. There's problems against the church that I don't know where they are. But I'm here to tell you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, that the weapon of prayer is the thing that governs everything. It may not, the television may not like it. I'm going to preach a while here this morning. Amen. I, I've, I've come to tell you something. I've come to tell you that everything's just right. There's, there's nothing come your way that you cannot conquer. There's nothing happening to you if you're walking with God that isn't in the will of God. Hallelujah. Everything's all right. Just walk on. God's doing something with your life. Persevering. Romans 18 and 1 through 8. Jesus gives a parable of a woman coming to an unjust judge. And he sent her away with, with, with very uh, mean to her. He had no compassion, but she found her only knocking again. Amen. Knocking again. Finally, he said, I don't fear man. I don't fear the devil. But this woman is not going to stop until I do something. God is saying to us, this little confessional mess, lay me down to sleep prayer meeting. Our forefathers equated believing God with praying through. And is lay hold of God and hold on till there's an answer. We somehow lost that ability. We go pray for people, lay hands on them, say, now if you have to go to the hospital, call me. Amen. We didn't go there to believe anything in the first place. I can tell you, every promise in this book, it's not negotiable. It can be won. It doesn't matter what it is. If we will persevere, this book teaches much about perseverance. Amen. You take such words as diligence and perseverance and holding on. We, you find what God is talking about. We come a-running up. We've got the inner healers and the gurus of religion calling everything a devil coming in. And we're trying and struggling to get somebody to do what only you can do. Press yourself on that altar. you got kids that are lost. You're sick. You have a need. Lay a hold of God. Let Him know like Daniel that you know it's the will of God what you're after. I will not leave this altar until there's an answer to this prayer. I'm here on your hands. God said that's what faith is all about. Nevertheless, He said at the end of that parable, when the Son of Man comes back, will He find any faith in the earth? Will He find anybody with the ability just to hang on until there's an answer? Will He find them? Perseverance, abiding. John 15 and 7, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. You can ask what you will, and it shall be done. When I was born again by one spirit, I was put into Christ. According to Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 12 and 13, by one spirit were we all baptized into Christ. I have nothing to do with that. That's a miracle of God. I said, that's a miracle of God. When I repented and believed the gospel, the Holy Ghost put me into Christ. But then it said to me, you abide there. I have everything to do with staying there. The choices I make along this road, call it legalism, call it whatever you want to. Hell term, that term, brother, in the sense that they're trying to make it. If I abide in Christ, then I am safe from the storm. I can overcome, win. I'm more than a conqueror as through faith and prayer. I abide in Christ. In Christ. Importunity. In Luke 11, 5 and 10, Matthew 50, amen, importunity. There come that man wanting bread at midnight. He said, I've got visitors come. I'm sorry, he said, I'm in bed. Those days they, the, the bed was in the wall, and when it come down, it locked the door. He said, I've done locked the doors. My kids are in bed. I'd have to get them up. I'd have to put the bed back into the wall. Amen, it's too much trouble. Come back in the morning. 
But the man said, no, I need bread tonight. These folks have come a long ways. They're hungry. I need bread tonight, not tomorrow. And the Bible said, finally, not because of, of just the plea of the man, but because he knew that he wasn't going to get in sleep anyway. The man's not going to turn loose. He's going to get bread. My God, we go to the altar with a half-hearted, lay me down to sleep. We don't get it in five minutes. We say, I guess it wasn't the will of God. No wonder your life is half defeated. Consider that Jesus, the Son of God, pray. How much more do we need to pray? He still ministers. Said He ever lives to make intercession for you and I. He still pray. And you have the audacity to believe that you can make it without prayer. 90% of the church believes that somehow. That they can make it without prayer. For whom He foreknew, He did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Satan so fears the power of prayer that he'll do anything to keep you from having a life of prayer. I, I'm going to tell you something. You listen to him. He's so afraid of a prayer meeting. He's not afraid of anything else. No, no. Hey, I, I appreciate it. Oh, listen. I've always been an emotional man. Things excite me. And I get happy. Amen. I, I'm not saying the Holy Ghost takes my feet and jumps them around. I just jump them around like I clap my hands. Amen. But I, I can tell you this. I saw people kick their shoes halfway to that ceiling on a Sunday night. Didn't know they saved on a Monday. Amen. I can tell you the thing that secures that life is that life settled in God, in prayer. Amen. Holding on, laying a hold of God. The devil will do anything. He'll make you believe anything to keep you out of a life of prayer. Observe the thought battles you go through. The interruptions when you go to pray. Physical weakness that occur when you try to pray. I'm talking to people that have been there. Amen. You know when you get, get before God. I can tell you, 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 I, I, I almost hide over there in the prayer meeting. Amen. Somewhere get under the platform. Because just as sure as you touch the Holy Ghost, there'll be somebody come touch you. Amen. The interruptions, the thought pattern, everything is designed to keep you from prayer. Bloody Queen Mary said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies of Europe. The prayers of one man struck more terror to that devilish queen's heart than all the armies of Europe. Let me tell you, don't you ever forget the devil is not blind to the fact that somebody's on their knees. Amen. Oh, no. Oh, he knows that. He begins to quake when there's a sincerity about it. He don't worry about that now. Lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. But when there is that heart burdened and stirred that lays before the altar of God, hell is observant. I said, hell is observant. Hell knows. I said, it knows, mister. There is no other weapon like the weapon of prayer. Because everything else is games without that man prophesying that hadn't come from that prayer chamber is nothing. Amen. It's just words he says. But it is that heart is moved by prayer. But I've got to move on. A good conscience. 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 19 talks about it. This good conscience is closely related to holiness. A holy life makes for a good, clear conscience. Of this, the Bible teaches some strong things. Consider 1 Peter 1, 15. Be ye holy, for I am holy. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? First Peter 4, 18. Holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12 and 14. Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. First Corinthians 1 and 30. There obviously must be a penitent heart. Second Corinthians 7 and 11. With a carefulness towards sin. Oh, what a tragedy of our time. We are more of a peace movement anymore than we are of saving men from sin. We, we call sin mistake. Amen. Everybody makes a mistake. Let me tell you something. Adultery ain't no mistake. Fornication ain't no mistake. Stealing ain't no mistake. Drunkenness ain't no mistake. It's sin. And the Bible said God hates sin. 
God forgives. But the wages of sin is still death. There's consequences to sin, mister. The church is trying to make an easy place for folks to lay down on. And through the big name preachers of our time, we've almost made Calvary a license to sin. Have an affair with a woman oh, on a Friday night. Weep a little on a Saturday morning. Preach again on a Sunday. I'm telling you, more moral sin puts a man out of business as far as this pulpit is concerned. Put it any way you want to put it, mister. He that committeth adultery with a woman, a wound in his honor shall he receive, and his reproach will never be wiped away. Hide this book in your heart. You won't sin against God. There's three sins in this Bible outstanding. In this order, there is idolatry, adultery, and oppression. God says to you, you mess with idolatry. And you can so pollute the place that Christ can't even work in it. Moses will move the tabernacle outside of a temple grounds where idolatry took place. God said, get it out. It's so polluted. Adultery so sets a man in degradation. How, Joseph said, can such a man as I so sin against God? And to oppress the poor will close heaven to your ears. That's right. Amen. To your cry. Holiness. There must be a penitent heart with a carefulness towards sin. Amen. Let me tell you something, folks. God hates sin. Amen. Don't you go call it no mistake. Amen. Amen. If you are born again, believe you don't have to live that way. Right. I don't Amen. care what these bumper stickers say. Right. I, 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 I'm, I, Christians are not perfected. They're only forgiven. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I'm more than forgiven. I'm born again. Any man be in Christ as a new creation. And the Bible said that which is born of God cannot sin. All the sin is because we keep tolerating this lower nature. It's painful to kill it. And so we let it live. No, no, brother. You, we, we make so much emphasis today in our preaching about how we have to sin. I watched till I got sick to my stomach talking about if a man had a heart attack. If he'd been saved and he's an act of adultery and died in that act of adultery, then he'd go to heaven. Then they went on and said, you have sin, yeah, you have sin, yeah. Well, I can tell you one thing, if I, if I sinned before I got to this church, I confess that sin, and it's gone. We're so dealing with you have to sin, that we make an excuse for our loose living. That's right, amen. We've made the flesh the devil, so that we have an excuse, well, he couldn't cast it out. Listen to me. We must see sin as God sees it. We must be a clearing of ourselves before offended parties. There must be a zeal for what's right. Confession of sin brings a needed cleansing according to 1 John 1 and 9. A good conscience will never fear skeletons being pulled out of the closet. Amen. I don't have to live in fear. Amen. We have an evangelist that come. Amen. He's going to come preach and all this stuff that broke out, he told Robert, he'd like to stay in the home of somebody. He said, you know, uh, the motels where we stay is dangerous. It's only dangerous you want it to be, brother. I said, it's only dangerous. I believe I can walk along the very brink of hell. I'm not talking about tempting God. I'm talking about I can live where I have to live. I can be a Christian, mister. It isn't a glass house thing. It isn't a thing of environment. God has given me power to live. Good conscience. The Bible said, be sure your sins will find you out. I don't strike terror to the heart. Amen. Of a man that's walking with God. The believer can live an honest and open life. Not fearing what the devil is going to bring up in the past. Amen. Amen. I was 27 years old when I got saved. God wiped that out. Amen. I, I, I misused this body. And, and you pay for that. You lost an eye and a drunken brawl. Getting saved won't put it back. I can tell you one thing, the sin won't be remembered against me anymore at the judgment. That's gone. And the Bible said, if I walk in the light as he is in the light, amen, then I am. I'm telling you, you read the book of Leviticus and all through there, the offerings of blood and the different offerings, you will find that all of those offerings, the peace offering, the sin offering, the burnt offering, amen, they track sin to its remotest haunt. They track sin to the unconscious state. Amen. Every one of those, if, if, if man may.
may have sinned and didn't know it. They were sacrifices for that. I, I can tell you just like the seven redemptive names of God. Amen. We've got books wrote on them. People are trying to memorize Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi. You don't have to remember none of that. Just remember the name Jesus. Oh, hallelujah to God. Oh, my God. That's all you've got to remember. Because in Him is the fullness of the Godhead complete. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. All those diff different sacrifices trace sin to its remotest place. Amen. I, I don't have to go back and understand all those because there was one blood shed at one time. Thank God that takes care of sin, tracks it to its remotest haunt. The unconscious sin, the presumptuous sin, if I walk in the light. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. My God, I feel Jesus here. Oh, I feel Jesus here. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Want to deal with that? The next weapon. The blood of Jesus. Revelation 12, 11. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. Huh. Oh, yes. The blood, the precious blood. That is a theme of type and prophecy throughout the Old Testament. Nothing else. Everything was Christ. That law was a schoolmaster to lead me to Him. Every lamb that ever died, every goat ever turned loose, was saying, There's coming one. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God, if the blood of bulls and goats could have put away sin, there'd been no need for this lamb to come. But that wasn't possible. So one day, 2,000 years ago, on a hill called Calvary, God's lamb died. A blood was shed. Oh my God, what a weapon, what a weapon. It is joy uh, and cleansing of believers now. It paid for sin. It opened up access to prayer. It purchased the church. It purchased our conscience and a multitude of other things. Oh, hallelujah to God. There he has been opened up to me. There was it all through the Old Testament. Only the high priest. That once he wake up out there. That once a year. Listen, the high priest once a year could go in. But when he died, that veil was rent. And now the Bible said, I can come boldly to the throne of grace. There's a way been opened up. A new and a living way. See the blood. The blood. The blood. The blood. The blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. My God. Oh, I'm talking about it. Oh, it purchased the church. Thank God it purchased my redemption. It made it possible for me to make it all the way. Amen. After redemption, one of the most important uses of the blood is often overlooked. It's a means of defeating Satan in battle. The Bible said the devil hates the blood. He fears its power. He's been overcome by it. The mention of it in word or song causes terrible shaking through hell. That's the reason most of the courses and the psalms today have nothing to do with the blood. They're all about you being a king's kid. I'm telling you the thing you need to center on. Not so much you're a king's kid, but what made you a king's kid? Somebody died. Some blood was shed. Oh, hallelujah to God. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. What a weapon. Oh, yes. The mention of the blood in song or in message causes tremors to roll through that kingdom of darkness. Oh yes, the actual spirit of use it against the devil makes us victors in Christ, makes Satan the defeated one. Stated in John 1 and 7 as a thought to benefit from. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then the blood, the blood cleanses. Oh. Oh, listen, you walk with God, you walk with God, this process of sanctification 
is going to continue to reveal in your heart things that God don't like. But it's just because you didn't know it. The Bible said growth process is that. God reveals. He knows what I don't know. And as I walk in that light though, those things are there. But the blood, oh my God, keeps me in fellowship until God reveals to me. Then once he says, when I reveal it, you must be away with it. I'm here to tell you, there's a lot of things in your life you don't know about. But as you walk in the light, as he's in the light, that blood keeps you fit for heaven. Oh, why don't you worship God? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> not only a good conscience not only prayer not only the blood but our testimony connected with that blood overcame him the devil by the blood of the lamb the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto death a good testimony for the believer is the, is the most prized possession we should so live to protect it Paul said to Timothy, guard the deposit, son. You don't have anything but a testimony. That's the reason God said, God said you must have as a minister a, a, a good report of the people outside. You have a lot of silly people in the church that will overlook anything. But I'm telling you, that crowd out there, they don't overlook it. They know what's what when you're walking with God. They're not, amen, a good conscience toward God. And you don't have anything Beside your testimony, you lose that, you lost everything. You lose that testimony. Where the folks don't look at you. I'll tell you something, young people. The wages of sin is death. I can tell you, this is a promiscuous age. Sex has become uh, quite a, a conversation. No longer are we talking about absence. We're talking about telling you how to do it and keep them getting AIDS. I can tell you there's something worse than AIDS. And that's death. God Almighty. The AIDS brings death to the physical. But sin, the wages of sin is death. Engage yourself in the wrong kind of living. I can tell you one thing. It'll kill you. Amen. I said it'll kill you. The wages of sin is death. It isn't a matter of learning how to have safe sex. It's a matter of absence. Amen. God. They, they, have, they have in the schools today all kinds of sex educations. And most of it centers on how to do it and be safe. Even the government's got tapes they'll send you on how to be safe in homosexuality. I, I told a man talking about it. I said they have the best sex education now as a boy that they'll ever have in any school. He said didn't have it. I said yes they did. I said they had it. Every day the teacher, the superintendent, the principal, my mother, my dad told me, you don't do that till you get married. Yeah, you hear me? That's the best education you get anywhere. Oh, hallelujah to God. I'm telling you, your testimony is everything. Your testimony. God is telling us. Amen. If the quality is right, our testimony. Our testimony can be most effective against the lies, slurs, and other attacks of the devil on the truth. It's also rebuked him for his incapable well, of producing a top quality counterfeit Christian. He's always trying. That's what the terrors are. Amen. The devil's always trying to produce. Amen. Hitler was going to produce a super race. That's what the New Age is after. Amen. They're trying to produce a, a new a, a, a super race. I can tell you the only way that happened is to be born again. Amen. Amen. That, that race of people that are the firstborn he was, now we are many brethren brought in to it. Amen. But a good testimony is a rebuke to the devil because he can't produce that. Only believers can live a Christian life by God's standards. Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you something else. In this day, when all the talk of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, when we have all this you say what I say kind of junk, yeah. teaching people how to talk in tongues, play games with the Holy Spirit, I'm going to tell you nothing on this earth 
ever produced a specimen of Christianity like an old-fashioned baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God that mighty living in me, aware of it every minute of every day. Amen. Wherever I am, the Holy Ghost is here. Whether it's in the marketplace, whether you do me right or wrong, I recognize that Christ is there. Oh, hallelujah. If you're really born of God, filled with the Holy Ghost, you don't have to call anybody up and ask him if you've been filled. You know you feel somebody's in there. Hallelujah. I'm running out of time, but I want to throw this in. Attitude toward death. I said the attitude toward death. Amen. Most people spend most of the time trying to keep them dying. Right. Only to lose in the end. Amen. That's right. Some die to self and spend the rest of their life living. You know, a missionary a doctor once stated that God showed him that all doctors are failure. Because eventually all his patients are going to die. So he quit the doctor business and went out there to be a missionary. Amen. Listen, our attitude toward it, your attitude toward, to, toward death will greatly affect your warfare. I just picked this up in an old book. It said tradition states that Caesar called the Apostle Paul in for trial and began to threaten the great preacher. He said to him, I'll drive all your friends away. Paul said, they're all gone now, but Timothy... He said, I'll take all of your possessions. He said, Mr. Caesar, I lost everything when I found Christ. He said to him, I'll kill you. Paul said, you can't kill me, sir. My life is hid with God in Christ. Oh, listen. said that Caesar becomes so frustrated that he could do nothing against the Paul. What can the devil do against us if our attitude toward death for me to live as Christ and to die as gain? Our attitude toward that grave will govern everything about you, ladies and gentlemen. When we live that way. I'm going to tell you something. That's a weapon against hell. Oh, listen, that's a weapon against that darkness. He comes to you saying, I'm going to kill you. You can't kill me. I'm dead. I'm going to take everything you've got. Don't have anything. I counted everything that lost that I may gain in Christ. I'm going to run all your friends away. Well, them all left me when I got saved. Got new ones now. You can't run on. Oh, my God. I'm feeling this this morning. I said I'm feeling this this morning. Can't run out of time. Jesus. Jesus has made us more than a conqueror. These are the weapons of our warfare. The Holy Spirit. Listen, the Holy Spirit finally. He is the weapon. Walk in the Spirit. And you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Say what you want. Believe anything you want. I can tell you it is as imperative that a born again believer be filled with the Holy Ghost. As it is for an unregenerate man to be born again. I cannot overcome the devil. Paul said, you were born by the Spirit. You cannot perfect yourself in the flesh. The Holy Spirit is the greatest single weapon. Because he makes the rest of them effective. The weapons of your warfare are not carnal. Bow your head with me. We leave these folks in this television audience. Let the message rule your heart. Jesus loves you and we love you. People that know worship in this place. We ask you to come. God bless you. Good night. Not too many people like B.H. Clendenin. That's who we came through with, B.H. Clendenin and guys like that. Because you got to have the real thing. Now, you got to have some firepower. All this manby pamby junk going on now. I don't know where this stuff came from, but we got to go back to that old fire and brimstone no holes barred preaching and teaching so people will learn you can't compromise this there is only one way in and that's the narrow way of jesus christ alone and being baptized in the holy ghost people don't even have an urgency to get the holy ghost we got saying back in the 80s man and this thing they told you seek the holy ghost because you don't you got to have some power to live this thing and now folks just hanging around church without the holy ghost and you'll find most of the time when people stir up mess, they don't have the Holy Ghost.
because they're using their carnal minds trying to figure out what God said in his word, and you'll never understand it that way. So we're talking about picking up right where, where Burt Clinton left off, the warfare, the ground war and the air war. We're going to amplify what he said just a little bit and show you the difference between the two, the ground war and the air war, where we're, where we're sitting right now on earth and what has to happen next. Everything you've seen up to this point is preparation. God has not even moved yet. He's preparing an army so that when he moves, we won't fail. Historically, we've seen a lot of guys take on the devil. I mean, back in the 80s and, and, and into the early 90s, Jimmy Swaggart was a powerful force in America. Americans knew Jimmy Swaggart. The government feared Jimmy Swaggart. I mean, you'd have gatherings with Jimmy, Jimmy Swaggart, 50,000 people would show up. You go down to South America, 100,000 people in a stadium. What the devil do? Hit him with an undermining of his testimony. He went for the juggler vein. And most of the time, the devil going to send you that fine young thing to take you down. Study Adam. Study David. Study Samson. Study Ahab. There's always something wrapped around somebody's skirt tail that's going to take the dude down. So you got to know that and set up defenses in your mind knowing how he's coming. The examples in the Bible are uh, to allow you to see what's coming down the trail and prepare to defend yourself. Read Proverbs chapter one through chapter seven. It's all dedicated to that. That woman, that stealth fighter, that undercurrent, the power is what she's using to cut a guy's throat. You gotta know that in this and you build up defenses in your own mind. You don't become paranoid, but you become very aware that borders, borders on paranoia. I mean, you, you ride up against paranoid without becoming paranoid because you got to know what's going on down here. Right now, the devil is training and equipping an army of harlots to destroy every guy in sight. They're coming and they're coming heavy. That's why Amber Rose is out there in the marketplace, butt naked, bare butt naked, egg stripper that has no affinity toward anybody as far as disgracing herself because she's already disgraced in her own eyes. So she'll walk around butt naked and feel nothing about it, designed to solicit lust. The devil can grab a hold of lust in you and pull it up out of you, he's got you right there. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, pride of life are the three devil entry points to the human soul. He's coming through the lust of the eyes, what you desire with your eyes, the lust of the flesh, what your body craves as far as especially sexual sin, and the pride of biological life. In other words, living down here and being proud about it. Those three things are the entry points for Satan's kingdom. So let's look at this ground war and the air war. Father, we ask you to bless this time as we share the word of God. Keep our minds in perfect peace as they're stayed on you. Give us the impetus, God, to take on the devil and win this warfare in these last and evil days. We'll give you the praise and glory and honor for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Daniel chapter 10, we're talking about the ground war and the air war. Daniel chapter 10. Notice how it's always constructed around prayer. A praying person is going to begin to initiate and trigger a tremendous warfare. And I'm going to show you in Daniel chapter 10 why that happens. You'll get a lot of attention from the devil. The more you pray, the more he's going to pay attention to you. Because he knows what? God answers prayer. Yeah. So if you begin to pray on earth, the devil knows. Now God is going to hearken to that. and He's going to begin to respond to him. We got to stop that prayer. That's why we have a prayer line every night. And you have 10 people show up with a thousand people listening to the messages. They don't want to pray, they just want to listen to messages because you very rarely find a person that will pay a personal price for this. They want to glean from somebody else. See, they want to eat from the table without cooking the meal. That's the human nature in place. You have a picnic, there'll be those that will cook, make potato salad, make all kinds of dishes and bring them to the picnic. And then you, you see a bomb show with a fork brought nothing to the picnic but wants to eat all day and they'll be the first one to pack up their car full of leftovers yep. and drive off yep. and won't even pick up the picnic grounds and take the trash to the dumpster mm -hmm. all they got is a fork they have a fork in their pocket at all times just walking around 
looking to partake of what somebody else labor, labor to produce. That's the very essence of sin, a sinful nature. They don't want to do anything, but they want to glean from what everybody else did. That's an evil person. It's time to forsake those kinds of people. God wants people who are in this thing for themselves, who have their hands to the plow and not looking back. Remember, you're plowing the field now. That's real. And that's always going to cost you. I aerated my yard the other day. My hand all cut up and cut real bad because that aerator will drag you around like you're a kid. <laughs> an aerator, you can't play with an aerator. I thought a tiller was bad. When you, put a, you get a powerful aerator, man, you be pulled around the yard and thrown around like a little rag doll. And then ripped my hand all up. But see, if you go and do anything that's laborious, you're going to have some kind of a physical something to happen to you. This thing is real. Everything is going to be experiencing tension right along through in here because God's raising up an army and he's got to discipline us. He's got to shape and mold us to make us ready to engage in a war. We haven't seen a spiritual war yet. This is all preparation. The Mickey Mouse stuff we're going through is not going to compare to what's about to happen. So you've got to be forged some kind of a way not to faint in battle. The Bible says if you faint in battle, what? It's because your strength was small. He says if you faint when you see the foot soldiers, what are you going to do when the horsemen come over the ridge? So don't complain about little devils now because the big devils are on the way. you got to be prepared for that now. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was what? God will show you something that's going to happen a long time away now and tells you to do what? Prepare for it. He saw the thing, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. So what's fasting called? Mourning. I'm mourning. I'm weak. I'm kind of deprived inside because I'm not feeding myself. You're going to get weak, and when you're weak, the Bible says what? It's when the Lord is strong. When I'm weak, I'm strong because the Lord is undergirding me. I'll feel weak, but that's my maximum time of strength. You want to be disempowered in this so Jesus can raise up. So mourning for three weeks. This man has taken on 21 days now of mourning. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hadakel, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with the fine gold of Euphus. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms as his feet, and his feet like in color to polish brass. And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude, and I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. So, you know, the spirit world had breached, and a spiritual being had come across, the men couldn't see the vision, but the atmosphere terrified them, and they ran for their lives. You don't want to be in certain people when they're praying, with certain people when they're praying. A young boy tried to pray with Smith Wigglesworth. Smith Wigglesworth told him, you, you don't want to pray with me because when God's presence manifests himself, it might be too much for you. He said, oh, I can take it. He went to pray with Smith Wigglesworth and ran from the room terrified. Because when that spirit world breaches and a being comes across, if you're in the flesh, it will, it will totally terrify you. This is what happened when Daniel prayed through. See, if you stay in prayer for real a long time with God, something's going to happen. You're going to begin to experience dreams, visions, and possible visitations from that realm. See, that's why people stay on Facebook talking all day. That tells you they're not engaging God in prayer and getting a personal personal visitation and revelation from God because they talk too much. 
They want to examine everybody and examine the church and tell you the flaws of what people should be doing. What are you doing? Don't examine what anybody else has. Do you have the power? And they always speak of the collective we, what we should be doing. No, what should you be doing? Don't bring up anybody else in this. Until you've got the goods, shut your mouth and stop examining other people. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. See how he got weak? For my confidence was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. A lot of times, people will lose all functions of their, body, of their bodies and just lose strength. That's why a lot of times people will faint. They will just fall out. Because if this thing breaches, all strength from the human is gone. Yet hear I the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face. Now, so he must have been laid out prostrate. <clears throat> laid out prostrate in a deep sleep on his face. He said, I was on, in a deep sleep on my face. The man was just standing there. He was fasting and praying and seeking God now. See, when you begin to do these things, now something's going to really happen. That's why people want to get churchy and religious and go to church and talk a bunch of Christianese. It's like Chinese, you know, Christianese. <laughs> Christianese is a foreign language. You just talk a bunch of Bible gibberish, but you have nothing really of any essence to contribute. They can't do anything about anything. They just speak Christianese all day. Talking about the word and what the Lord going to do and uh, having this apostolic prophetic anointing on my life and all that junk. And can't do a thing about anything. But those people always provide commentary to others that are moving ahead. But when you begin to set your face, now remember this man set his face like a flint. I'm going to pierce this veil. I'm going to become a... A, a person that's focused on piercing this thing and pray through and break through. I need an answer. See, it's one thing to pray prayers. It's another thing to pray for an answer. Some people just say prayers thinking they're impressing people. They have no essence in them to really break through. It's just a bunch of gibberish. But people who pray with real determined effort and focus, they pray differently. And you can tell from their voices that this is not the same kind of a person. This is a different kind of a person. They really know the Lord. They spent time with the Lord. And most of all, their prayers are dipped in the Holy Ghost. See, and this is an intangible thing when you're dealing with people that pray. You can tell who's got the Holy Ghost upon them and people who don't. It's like a, an esoteric spiritual presence around these people that pray in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost is not praying in tongues. Did you know that? Talking in tongues is not praying in the Holy Ghost. You can speak... English and be praying in the Holy Ghost if the Holy Ghost is anointing your prayer. So it's all about being in the Holy Ghost and where flesh is, the Holy Ghost is not. Wherever flesh is, the Holy Ghost is not. You can get mental information and mental data, I call it mental ascension, and no junk, but don't have the Holy Ghost upon you. The Holy Ghost does not draw nigh to everybody. So you can see a lot of stuff that sounds real religious and spiritual and deep to people. And God won't even be hearing you. But you know what you can do in your own mind? Impress yourself. I really, man, I really, I set that place on fire praying. And everybody was saying to themselves, I sure do wish they would shut up. And people like that usually pray the longest. Have you noticed that the people that have, the, 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 the less the anointing, the longer they pray. And you want to say, dog. Then somebody get on, 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 on the prayer line, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. And that carried power. It shook the whole atmosphere. Yeah. See, you got to get in touch with the Lord and let this thing be spirit driven and not driven by the flesh. Look at this. Deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. Now notice, man, remember this now. This is just a guy just like you or me. He ain't nobody special or nothing like that. He's just a guy that did what he did and God responded to him. Daniel could have been the guy living next door to you. He could have been you mowing your grass. 
Daniel is just a guy. It, God is no respecter of persons. If he came to see Daniel, he'll come to see you. You set your mind and your face to pray and set your heart on God alone for 21 days and get in your room by yourself every day. Something's going to happen. You're going to start having something experiential in your home. Somebody coming to see you. See, people say, well, I know I'm not going to be praying then, God. Shoot, I ain't ready for that. Man. See, that's what the devil made everything. Here you are, a spirit being, talking about you're born again and a child of God, but don't want to really see anything happen. So when I'm talking like this over the airwaves and live stream, it's a bunch of people afraid of this, and they fight it because they're not ready to see it happen. I'm talking to people. I'm giving you impetus. I'm trying to motivate you to go do it. So when he breaks through and breaks out upon everybody, man, that thing going to be like a turbine spin. It's going to be a dynamic power because you got a lot of people that pray through and really know God. And you don't need anybody to reinforce you because I got mine. See, when you got your inheritance, you got your Holy Ghost, your portion, you don't look around because I'm not worried about your gift because what? I got mine. Caleb wasn't thinking about you. Joshua didn't mention your name. I got mine. <laughs> when you got yours, you don't talk a whole lot because I don't know about your gold and silver. I got mine. See, that's the way it goes down in this. People who talk a lot, they don't have it. People that's got it, they never have to defend themselves and never talk a lot. We receive all kinds of accusations what difference does it really make? The devil is what? The accuser of the brethren. It's normal. If you begin to get into this, folk going to accuse you and talk about you like a D-O-G dog. It's normal. What's the impetus behind that? They can't control you anymore. People hate people that they can't control. You don't respond to them anymore. That's what's getting them mad. Witches like to control folks. They practice witchcraft for control. And when the witchcraft is not working anymore, they don't like you. So I said, you went over to that old stupid church with that old price guy, and now you'd become a fool. They begin to accuse you. No, what really happened is this. If a person has made a fool out of Dan through witchcraft for 20 years, they lose control of them. They've already confined and defined Dan as a fool. So therefore, if I can't control you anymore, you're a fool, and you can't think for yourself. So it's not that you're thinking for yourself. Somebody else replaced and displaced me, and now they're controlling you because you're a stupid fool. That's what they get mad about. So they're going to always look past Dan to that price guy. I know it happens to me all the time. You got husbands mad at their wives because of that price guy. You don't listen to nothing I say, but that old preacher, that old punk. <laughs> Wait a minute, man. I just preach a generic gospel. If your wife believed it and got saved and went on down the road, it has nothing to do with me. I'm not seducing your wife. You're not mad at me. You're mad at the Lord. And you see me as a, as a person that represents the Lord. That's who you're really mad at. Because you used to do your wife any kind of way and she went for the old tricks of the trade you played on her and now she's not controllable and she's a fool to you so therefore it must be that dude at church that's talking to you and got in your head. You're probably laying around with that joke. They got to do that because they lost control of you. This thing is real. Everything in this warfare is real. It's tangible. It's practical. The devil attacks you for a reason. If he sees you decreasing and losing everything, he's going to attack you because, you know, God is going to fill you after he did what emptied you. God fills up that which he empties. And the more you decrease, the more you're getting closer to your destiny. And the devil's going to begin to, to strike physically. He'll make you sick as a dog. He'll do anything he can to try to stop you from being filled with the Holy Ghost. The devil's not afraid of us. He's afraid of the Holy Ghost. So, buddy, you want to become a vessel 
full of the Holy Ghost, that's a vessel fit for the master to use. Look at this. That hand touched me, set me up upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. It's a terrifying experience to breach that spirit world now. Don't think you're going to go over there and just be normal and average and all of that. Notice now, all religious structures and denominations are determined and designed not to let you go into the spirit world to meet God. They set up barriers and teach you stuff that you'll never know God. It's where Calvinism and once saved, always saved and unconditional eternal security comes from. Baptists, huge Baptist organizations and Methodists and all these different denominations are so you'll never meet God and become a spirit being full of the Holy Ghost. That's what they're designed to do. They teach you not to seek God and the Holy Ghost. This thing, man, is it's a dirty deal being played out. John MacArthur tells you that all gifts have ceased. Talking in tongues is of the devil. Charismatics are demon possessed and crazy because he don't have the Holy Ghost. Never listen to anybody fighting the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost is the power that makes us able to overcome the devil and win a metaphysical war. See, if, we, if he's the governor of the weapons, the devil goes against the governor of the weapons so the devil knows he has no force to contend with because we've been what? Disempowered. The joker trying to do what? Disarm us. Yes. So we got no weapons. Yes. Every weapon is mighty where? Through God. It got to be launched through the Holy Ghost. That's right. That's weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty only launched through God, not through me and you. Right. You got to have Holy Ghost power. Yes. Don't fret. Don't faint. Don't complain when you're going through. Go harder. Yes. Go harder. You go harder. Say, okay, devil. I see I'm on the right track. You're attacking me. Let me pray a little. Let me fast a little bit more. Let me go deeper. Don't give up. Go deeper. At some point, if you lost everything, you got nothing to lose. I might as well go for broke. Since I'm already at double zero at the bank account, I might as well just go for broke. I got nothing to lose. You want to be a person that's got nothing to lose in this. What can the devil threaten for you with if you got nothing to lose? That's, you're, the, you're in a perfect place, but the world sees it in opposites. They see you as going through and diminishing when God is raising you up. Man, this thing is perfect, man, because the ignorance of the devil in the world could never see it and understand it, and God hides you in your demise. They, can't you see people stay away from you when you're broke? That got rid of all those folk that you didn't need around you. They, they turn around. They see you coming. <laughs> we were going through financially one time. Barbara's relative, man, she went to see her relative. She, I, I forgot to pay my rent. I got to pay my mortgage. I should, didn't go to talk about your mortgage. I just came by to say hello. Thinking you're going to do what? Hello. Ask me for some money. It keeps the devil away from you because the devil not going to be around you if he thinks you're going to ask him for something. That's God's way of doing this. is perfect logic, man. God is brilliant. Don't complain. The Bible says rejoice. Rejoice. That means the presence of God is resting on you. What you need to do then is get with the other folk going through and begin to pray through. We have fallen into a, a delusion of separating from the body when she, we should be amalgamating with the body. The devil practices what? Divide and conquer. He denominationalized the church to divide the church to conquer it. The joke is a, strate a strategic planner now, a brilliant strategist. He's a very logical thinker. If the devil wasn't evil, you might want to throw in with him. Because that joker can design some stuff, man, that is perfect logic. He knows that God operates in unity and being on one accord. So dissect, denominationalize, and divide to make everything dysfunctional. 
So people begin to do what? Turn on each other and fight about denominational doctrines and stuff like that. Man, it's, it's perfect. So you got to be a person that detaches yourself from all of that. And God will do that by decreasing you. Yep. And notice now when you go through and de decrease, notice how much stuff you don't care about. Right. Somebody come to you, you about ready to slap somebody. <laughs> don't, don't look, man. I don't want to hear nothing about that junk, man. I don't care about that. You could care less about the NBA championships when you're going through. But when you fat and got a bunch of money and, and living large, you out there, the life of the party. Invite people to your Super Bowl party. And all. See all that right there, man. You, he can get rid of all of that in your life. Just, just send you through the fire. <laughs> the trial of fire, chosen in a furnace of affliction, that'll change a lot of things real fast. Look at this. Says that when he spoke this word to me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you did set your heart to do what? Understand. Understand and to do what? Chasten thyself. Chasten thyself. Discipline yourself before your God, thy God. Thy words were heard and I came for what reason? Because of what you were saying. I came not because of somebody's words up in the atmosphere somewhere. God heard what you were saying and he dispatched me because he heard your words. This is a word warfare. Every weapon is out of your mouth. That's where the weapons are launched. So the heavens begin to move based on what you're saying. So don't say the wrong thing. Don't speak words of doubt. Don't speak words of negativity over yourself. Don't let anybody speak onto you something that will disempower you. You got to stay focused on what that word says and you got to pray through based on the positive influences of the Holy Spirit inspiring your prayer. Don't listen to negativity. Get away from negative, down-talking, down-trodden, half-baked, knuckle-headed, silly, stupid, undermining folks. Because they will disempower your prayer. They will disempower your believing. The devil's trying to strike at you by casting doubt, fear, and unbelief into your psyche. It never looks like what it is in God's economy. God sees a negative as a positive and a positive as a negative. Be well when men speak well of you, the Bible says. When you are going through to the world, the presence of God is resting on you. He's trying to move you to another place and he doesn't want the people in the world to infringe upon what he's doing. This thing is a dynamic that nobody can understand in the flesh. You just got to live through it. You'll only be able to identify with other people that are going through. Right. Notice how when you're going through, you can't talk to everybody because they can't even understand you. Right. You're speaking Japanese and they're from Russia. <laughs> they can't understand what you're saying. You got to talk to somebody that is going through or that has been through to understand you. This is the revelation the Bible says that the world cannot receive. Look at this. I came because of your words, Daniel. But look at this. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. There was a prince that rules over the province of Persia that stood against me as I came from heaven to earth. This is an interdimensional transfer and is governed and kept by these gods of this world. Spiritual entities that safeguard Persia against God's intrusion into Persia. Look at what I'm saying now. The angel is dispatched from God's throne coming to see Daniel about Daniel's words and a prince under the auspices of Satan withstood an angel. Now, this prince must have some power to stop an angel because he couldn't penetrate. 21 days, dispatched the angel the first day the man prayed. And the angel couldn't penetrate for 21 days at war 
were the prince that governed Persia. Remember that prince of Persia didn't stand alone. He had an army that under his command. A prince is governing other entities that protect Persia from God intruding into Persia. Every governmental authority, every domain on earth has a governing power dispatched by Satan to protect it against what? Uprisings from God's people. That's when you pray through for God to penetrate and contact you to empower you to initiate a ground war. Now watch this now. This is all logical. That's why people don't pray. Because the devil goes to work to do what? Disempower them from praying. He'll make you sleepy. He'll make you tired. He'll send in coops to tell you all kinds of junk. He'll try to distract you. He'll take your money from you. He'll make you sick. Anything he can do for you not to pray. Men ought always to pray and never faint, never give up. The devil knows that the angels and the weaponry is dispatched to earth because Daniel is praying. And they come because of your words. That's why praying in tongues carries so much power. You don't even know what you're praying for. But God can interpret the tongues. There are several hundred languages on earth. Which means there may be potentially 10 billion languages in the universe. Think about all the languages on earth you don't understand. We're on one planet now with 7.4 billion people and you can go to a foreign country and not even understand what they're saying. And that's just another human being. And the, and the, and, and the apostle says, though I speak in the tongues of angels and men, there are unlimited amounts of languages. There's no telling what you'll speak if you get baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's why people make fun of it. People do all kinds of Languages when they get baptized in the Holy Ghost. This sounds strange, weird, kooky. One guy was saying, an evangelist said that this, they were in a meeting and this, this lady from Africa kept jumping up there. And they thinking, what in the world? That must be the devil. Until he went to Africa and he saw a whole tribe of people doing that. They said, what is that? Well, that means praise the Lord. See, you don't, don't ever look at something and be so logical and so analytical that your carnal mind tries to understand everything God does. See, this thing bypasses the carnal mind. He does things, a lot of things, that appear foolish because he takes the foolish things. The things that are despised. The things that are nothing to man to do what? To confound the wise. He'll make it look stupid to people. Because he's against their wise thoughts. And their own carnal minds. And their knowledge. And their educations. He makes it look stupid to them. So they'll say oh that's just stupid foolishness. And that's where the blessing is. God loves to confound the wise folks. By doing something that seems totally illogical to them. So you see now. He says, this prince of Persia withheld me, stopped me, withstood me for 21, for 20 days. For one in 20 days, 21 days, this prince of Persia was there to stop me. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, God has a government, a chief prince, an archangel. The word arch means to rule over. An archbishop in Roman Catholicism is a bishop that rules over other bishops. An archangel is one that rules over other angels. So God saw that this messenger angel picked up contrary forces. He turned to Michael and dispatched him. Now you've got a warlord coming out of heaven. Big boy coming in. Reinforcements coming through. That's heavy, man. I don't even want to think about what Michael the archangel is like. Michael the archangel is assigned to protect Israel right now. You go to war against Israel... You got an armada of angels already set guard over them. Remember when Elijah was in the field with Gehazi? Going, and he said, man, we're going to lose the war. All these forces against us. He said, man, those that are with us are greater than them. Then he said, Lord, 
opened his eyes, and he saw chariots of fire with angels, men in those chariots, set for war. That's what's around us. But we got to get right. We got to get decreased. We got to pray through. We got to fast through to bring these forces into the ground war. We're trying to get angelic help to engage in this ground war. We'll destroy everything down here in just a minute. We just got to get right before God, get unified, get on one accord. Dunamis Tabernacle is all about this. We need a base camp to join the saints together in unity. Dunamis means power, a power tabernacle. That's all we need is power. But see, everybody's separated off and segregated trying to believe God alone somewhere. You'll never get victory alone because it's a body ministry in the New Testament. You need the body of Christ brought together on one accord. He's segmenting. He's fragmenting. He's dividing so we'll never get the anointing of God. How good it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. This is where the oil is poured down like over Aaron's head coming down and permeating the whole body because of the unity of the brethren. What I lack, Dan will have. What Dan lacks, Jerry will have. What Jerry lacks, Brian will have. You gotta have a body ministry coming together on one accord. Your body can function real good, but lose a leg. It's going to be hindered and hampered. All the body suffers when one member right. is cut off. We got to have the body of Christ come together on one accord. I'm not talking about incorporating the sin. See, the body of Christ is a sanctified, Holy Ghost filled organism. We're not trying to join together with the Methodists or the Episcopalians or the Roman Catholics. No, we're talking about individual organic people that have sought God and been purged of the flesh who come together and leave out all the discord and confusion because flesh is no longer present to undermine the operation of the body. That's what we got to have. That's why people are dying. And finally, he's going to amalgamate the dead people and bring them together. And, he's going to, and the question is going to arise then, can these dry bones live? He brings them back together again. Remember, he's reassembling. What you see in Ezekiel 37 is the reassembling of the body of Christ as, dis as displayed in the book of Acts. That's the dry bones that dried in the desert that God let die. Now he's going to reassemble the general assembly of the firstborn, but without flesh. They start off as bones, remember? Flesh is gone. Rotted off the bones. Now he says, I'll reamalgamate now. I'll stand them up as a body again. Then he says, prophesy to the wind and fill that body. You haven't seen the church in our generation. You've never been to church. You've never joined the church. I don't care how many preacher's hands you shook. Okay, how many roles your name are on. You've never seen the body of Christ because you haven't seen demonstrated spiritual power. If you don't see the gifts operative and the signs and wonders of the body of Christ, you haven't been to church, you've never been to church, you've never known the church, you haven't ever experienced the church, so leave the word church out of your vocabulary. God has to reassemble his church, and he's about to do that right now. He loves to do it in darkness and under austere conditions. That's when God is glorified. When nobody else can help us, that's when God comes. He loves that. Lazarus is dead. Now he shows up. When there's no hope, there is no wine at the marriage feast. Okay, now I can work. He loves to get the thing set to zero where there's nobody to get glory but Jesus because nobody could do this but Jesus. That's what's about to happen. Look at this. So he says, lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. So you see now, God dispatched Michael to help this messenger angel. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground and I became dumb. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him, 
that stood before me, O my Lord. By the vision, my, prayer, my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this, my Lord, talk with this, my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remains no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. And said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, yes, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture, truth, scripture of truth. And there is none that holds with me in these things, but Michael, your assigned prince, Michael has always be assigned, been assigned to Israel to save God Israel. So you see now, he says, I'm going to dispatch. But the prince of Grecia, another demonic entity is moving in to govern you. And you know what happened after Medo-Persia? Greece conquered Persia and the prince of Greece became the governing spiritual force over the territory. So you see now, we're looking at a hierarchy and a signed army given to safeguard the terrestrial plane of the earth. So when you begin to be called out and pray as an individual, you begin to engage these forces. Now that's why the Bible says one will put a thousand to flight, two ten thousand. Geometric progression says three will take on a hundred thousand, four a million, five ten million, six a hundred million. See, it goes into geometric progressions, seven, a billion. So you see why the devil fights unity. Yes. If we begin to consolidate in prayer, if we get on the same page in prayer, we do that every night at nine o'clock for a reason. We're trying to consolidate people in prayer, praying about the same thing. Praying, most people pray every night. God bring dunamis tabernacle to pass. God raised it up. God set us on rock one accord. Bring the finances in. That's doing something. Yes, it is. That's why the devil gets mad and begins to try to attack. Wants you to shut up. Don't shut up. Cry before the Lord day and night. Deuteronomy's Tabernacle is not about a church. Deuteronomy's Tabernacle is about a base camp for warlords. This is a soldier's base camp. We're not interested in church stuff anymore. Some joke in a pulpit preaching at you all day. And, and a choir just singing. That's part of services and all of that. But the effort is to equip you to engage the enemy as we take on the next phase of the war, which is a ground war. I'll show you that in a minute. But first, before the ground war takes place, the air war is being conducted to breach the heavens so these assistants can come down. Ministering spirits called to minister to whom? The heirs of salvation. Angels are ministering spirits sent by God to assist us as his heirs. They should be here with us. After Satan tried to tempt Jesus, the Bible says the angels came and did what? Yes. Ministered unto him. That's what we're supposed to be experiencing. The Bible says you can entertain a stranger and entertain an angel and not be aware of it. So you see now, we need to breach the heavenlies. Let these angels pour through. Let the power of God pour through. Let the Holy Ghost pour through. Then the ground war becomes effective because it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ is living in me. The anointed one has come via the Holy Ghost. So the air war is a prayer war. You see what it did in Daniel? The prayer war initiated an air war. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Jesus woke up every morning, went to a mountainous place to pray. That's what gave him his power. He lived not as the son of God. He lived as the son of Adam, the son of David. He was a man who, who depended on the power of the Holy Ghost, that he had to keep himself filled with the Holy Ghost to do what he did. So he stayed in prayer. You saw the first fast he initiated when he came out of that Jordan River and got baptized. He went and prayed and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. That was just the fast you saw about and heard about in, in the Bible. Jesus stayed in a fasted life. 
because he's kept the power generating out of himself. Men ought always to pray, and you couple prayer with fasting, you get more power over bigger, stronger entities. That's the logic of God. He, you have to go to a place of initiating a air war, which is a prayer war, to get a breakthrough and move out as a body to conquer the devil. You see, the first thing you got to have happen to you as a real saint of God is you got to forsake everything to do this. You can't t bring it in. See, people are afraid of this because they haven't forsook everything. They still are attached to the world. So this becomes fearful because they're part of the devil's kingdom. They'll actually fight God's kingdom because they're still in covenant with the devil's kingdom. So anything that corresponds to God's kingdom becomes something that's questionable. I don't know. Now, that's kind of austere. That's kind of dramatic. You really going to take it this far? You really believe that? No. Turn loose to the devil so you can see the light. Your mind is still being contaminated and limited because you're attached to the devil's kingdom somewhere. You love the world still, so therefore the love of the world makes you love what? Your life. You're trying to save yourself. You know instinctively that the church is called to a war that you're not willing to fight and ready to fight. So you try to stop those that will fight the war by casting dispersions on it. But speak in doubt over it. Man, you think price may be a little bit too far out there? I'm not even out as far as I'm going to go. I haven't even left town yet. I haven't even left the beach yet. I'm still bringing stuff, equipment on the beach for the war. It's a Normandy invasion. We're still unloading ships and stuff. We haven't even attacked yet. And they're talking about you going too far. Imagine when the war really breaks out. And stuff really begins to jump off. It's going to be, man, it's going to be a rude awakening to the folks. You should have got ready for this and you played the fool. You tried to keep it safe and keep everybody just kind of playing it down. And let's just go to church over here and just listen to these songs and little sermons and go back home again on Sunday morning and Wednesday evening. That's all that you have to do and I'm saved. No, you ain't. You're religious. Real salvation is 25 hours a day, seven days a week. You never get out of this framework. You never let this thing lose your mind. You think about this thing all day and all night. And when you're sleeping, you're dreaming about it. The zeal of God's house will eat you up. It becomes the only thing that matters, not one of the things that matter. The worst thing you'll ever do is try to manage God and manage your salvation. Keep it compartmentalized so it's dignified to the people around you. The reason why you're undermined in salvation is because you're conscious of how you look to other people. When you don't care about what anybody thinks about you, you're about 90% of the way home. I could care less what they think about me. We come here as ambassadors from heaven. We are the true extraterrestrials. I bring a, a message from heaven to earth and I could care less about what the earth thinks about it. You got to be delivered from folks and to be delivered from folks, you got to stop caring about yourself. Amen. Wondering how I look to somebody. Don't say that. And people trying to, shh, Dan, don't say that. Don't, you know, tell them what they're going to think about you up in there saying that. Go on over there and get some, 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 some pork chops or something off the grill. Go on. Don't, don't. Shh. You're going to embarrass me. Dan, tell you, I could care less about you or them. Jesus walked around like this. Jesus, you offended the Pharisees and Sadducees. Man, what's the chaff to the wheat? I could care less about them. Let the dead bury the dead. You've got to be oblivious to your surroundings to walk with God because God is not afraid of these folks and he's not afraid of the devil. If God was afraid of the devil, we'd be in a bad situation. What is everybody engaged in an environment that's going to see you die out of it. Here you are caught up in this. You'll be dead in a few weeks. And here you are putting all your eggs in this basket. You got to leave here. Why would you be planning a future in a place that you're methodically dying out of? 
You're getting older as you're sitting here breathing. You're going to be dead. You need to emphasize eternal life and where you're going after here, not here. Lincoln Cemetery is full of dead folks that came through here. Why would you try to build some kind of a utopian society here when you've got to die? That's crazy. Ask Michael Jackson, ask Elvis Presley, ask all of them that have passed on. Whitney Houston, Luther Vandross, everybody millionaires, everybody got living hound hog, everybody living in mansions, they're dead. There's no continuing city here. There's no permanence here. Let me put all my eggs in the right basket and build myself a future in eternity at the expense of time and space. What would the Lord have you to do? Become an ambassador for Christ. Represent him here and he'll represent you there. And when you're through here, he'll say, come on board, my good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the rest of the Lord. You represented me there, so therefore I'm representing you here. You sell out to this mess down here, you're undermining your whole life. There is no destiny here. There is no future here. Go to school, get your degree, get a good job. You're going to die. Buy a new car, buy a house. You're still going to die. Get you some red sole shoes. They're going to be sitting in your closet when they're burying you. <laughs> you see how useless all this is? Everything you do here has no longevity, no substance. You're going to be dead. Embrace it. What are you afraid of if you're born again and saved? What are you trying to hang on to? Who are you trying to impress? I could care less. We've got a job to do. I'm here to do a job. That's it. I'm on assignment from heaven to earth. I'm a true extraterrestrial. I am E.T. Prayer is phoning home. See, when you pray, you're talking to your home base. You're talking to your father who is in heaven. You start the prayer of our father who art in heaven. Hallowed, holy, separated be thy name. God, we're praying for thy kingdom to come on earth just like it is in heaven. Let your will be done. That's what it's all about. It's about you letting the kingdom come through you, bringing heaven to earth. Your communication is with home. You got to let your mind descend above this. Set your affections on things above, not on the earth. You got to have all these scriptures come alive and activate and actualize in you. So this is a lived out experience and not a bunch of verbiage from a book. A book letter will not activate this. The Holy Ghost has to come alive in you. And he does that as you depreciate through fasting. And this book comes alive. And now you're a living epistle read of all men. You are a part of a new and living way. I'm alive to God and dead to this world. None of these things down here move me anymore. Because I could care less about them. No impact from anybody's words because I don't care about this kingdom and what you say. You have nothing to do with this matter. You're separated and segregated from the filth of the flesh, the world, and the devil. It's been cauterized and cut off from you. Man, you can enjoy life now. You can go on vacation. You're not conscious of race. You don't care if the white guy in Alabama don't like you. All I want is the stuff off the shelf right there I just asked you for. And that's it. And give me a Coke. You're not even conscious of them hating you and being, 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 a, being a, a prejudiced person because it doesn't matter. That's why any, any kind of energy trying to express your race is a dead work. We're a new people. We're a royal priesthood from another place. We have no continuing city here. I have no amalgamation with anything down here, race, culture, or any kind of special interest groups. Black lives matter just like every other life matters. It don't matter to me because I'm not of your world. That's your kingdom and your mess. Keep it over there. You can be a Republican, Democrat, Libertarian. You can be a conservative. You can be a liberal. That's y'all stuff. 
You're not from here if you've really been born again. Now, if you're not born again, what I'm saying is totally foreign to you. When you've mentally ascend, ascended to religion in your head and haven't had a heart birth, then everything I'm saying is way over your head. Because so you can't even identify with it because you haven't been born of God's spirit. This thing got to come into you through a new birth, a new life type coming by way of a new birth. And the things of this life will begin to grow strangely dim. You could care less about their stuff, man. I can go watch an NFL game, but I don't care about it like that. I'm not painting my face red and black with horns on my head, yelling, screaming. It ain't all that, man. What's wrong with you? People identify with what they worship. Idolatry is an all-encompassing spirit down here. To produce warriors, you first of all got to have a separated, sanctified people whose affections are above. We're talking about a, an air war. Praying through until this thing comes on you. Praying through until that spirit world breaches and the spirit beings come down. Things will begin to happen to you because portals will open up. There are spiritual portals that are governed by entities that try to safeguard those portals. See, pyramids in Egypt opened up portals. That's what they were designed to do. And they went there and they invited and invoked the fallen angels to come through those portals. That's why you see empires rise and fall. Because those particular people prayed to the gods that governed their empire. And that empire moved to preeminence as that powerful force they prayed to came to preeminence. That's why Greece displaced Persia. Because the Greeks were worshiping the Greek gods. It gave them power to displace Persia. What you see with the fallen angels is... In people groups, in nations, and in different dominions on earth, they basically play checkers and chess. They want to, they use us as people to play games with and to see who has more power. It's a chess game with them. We're just pawns in the devil's master game. They pit blacks against whites, against Hispanics, against Asians. It's just a big chess game to fallen angels. Human beings are pawns. They want you dumbed down so they can use you to play their silly games. But that's why you got to extract yourself from it. You got to know what this thing is all about. They want to play you like a chump. But when you get tired of getting played, then you have the impulse to say, no, hey, not me, man. You're not playing me no more. I've been dumb all my life. You walk around as a whore thinking you're some kind of a slayer. And the devil just using you as a chump, making a fool out of you. So I Amber Rose out there butt naked being played. This is crazy. They're not using anybody. They're getting used by entities they don't know about. That's why you got to get out of the game, get aligned with God, get some power, and seek and destroy the devil. You got to get some impetus in you. If you lose power, that means you got to pray through to get back your power. If you get weak, you got to say, God, I need to be re-empowered. I need to be regenerated. He told the man, told young Timothy, man, stir up the gift that's already in you. Stir it up. Power is waning. Fast. Pray till you see that turbine begin to spin again. The dynamo is losing energy. You should be nuclear powered inside, man. The Holy Ghost is nuclear power that needs no fuel. That thing is spinning you like a dynamo. But you got to stir him up. You got to get the Holy Ghost stirred up to a frenzy. There's no telling what you might do, man, if you're full of the Holy Ghost walking around. When he comes upon you, you'll go into magistrate court and tell the judge anything. <laughs> you cause you, you out of it. The president no matter to you, you're full of the Holy Ghost. Nathan says to David, the man is you. And read them like a book. The prophet didn't care about the king. The king is subject to the voice of the prophet. The president don't run this. The prophets do. Donald Trump better listen to the voice of the prophets. If you want to be successful. Listen to these boobs. Up there trying to give him counsel. He going to go under. You better get a man that knows God with you buddy. That can put a bug in your ear for real. 
Because he'll make you do what? Navigate around the what? The snares of the devil. The prophet can see. A prophet has eyes to see the unseeable. He'll tell you, they're planning this over here to take you down. Now, this is what God wants you to do. You know how God navigated the kings and the armies of Israel through the voice of a prophet? You had to have Samuel because Samuel telling you what to do. He had the eyes. He asked the prophet, is there any word from the Lord? The prophet said, there is word from the Lord. And read that guy like a book, gave him instructions, and if he followed the instructions, he would have good success. Obey your prophets, and every word will be established. You've got to have the ability to see down here, and God has given five-fold ministry gifts to make you able to see. Take advantage of every spiritual gift, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher to perfect you so you'll be able to do the work of the ministry. That's why we need structure to give access to every spiritual gift God has provided to shape and mold people into an entire mature person. This thing is all logical, but big mouth, ignorant people who know nothing about this, always just trying to talk in their ignorance, and you gotta ignore them and pray for them because you know they're ignorant. They're ignorant, they don't know. So everybody sat out on the outskirts of town with no affiliation with the church body trying to examine the church body and give commentary about it. Disregard them. If they're not in the warfare standing next to you on Nehemiah's wall being rebuilt, disregard them. Because every man was building that wall. The Bible said he had his, had, was putting that mortar and laying them bricks with one hand and had that sword in that other hand. Called board and border and you the thing jump off now. We can we can change up from building this wall now. It's gonna be on and popping. Had a weapon in one hand and building a wall with the other. So you gotta be like that. You want to listen to people who are in it with you, not outside of projecting into the environment. I'm not talking about Omega Ministries, I'm talking about the body of Christ universal. A non-participant has nothing to say to the body of Christ. Nothing. Because they got nothing to lose. If you got no skin in the game, you can talk big talk. You go and try to buy a house or buy some, some commercial property to the bank. You know the first thing they're going to tell you you need? You got a down payment? What are they asking you? You need to put skin in the game. We're not going to pay for the whole building because you'll renege on the payments and you got nothing to lose. Before you open your mouth about the body of Christ, you put some skin in the game. Or shut your mouth. God, I got to have something to lose in this. If you got nothing to lose, you do not qualify to verbalize one thing about the church. Shut your mouth. T-H, mouth. Put that spit on the end, you know, mouth. Shut your mouth. Because <laughs> that's what people do They talk and examine But they don't do one thing that's contributing to anything Shut up Please shut up And go away Air war Initiated first through prayer You saw it initiated in Daniel chapter 10 When he began to pray When it coupled with fasting Man God dispatched immediately about, He said from the first day You began to pray I left heaven on my way here, but I engaged this other entity. Remember, heaven is not so much like five billion miles away in, in the atmosphere. Heaven is another dimension. So it's coming across that portal into this dimension. He was leaving the fourth dimension, coming into the third. And the third dimension is safeguarded by the devil's entities. That's where he sets up a safeguard. He does not want the dimensional plane breached because when God pours through there, the devil's got problems. He's got problems. The devil actually invokes people to actually open up the portals to let his, his entities come across. That's what witches do in that hexagram on the floor. They stand in the middle of the hexagram, sky clad, butt naked, and they invoke the spirits to come across that portal. The devil opens it. And in comes all these spirits to fill the witch with power. 
So you're getting witches full of power and we got no Holy Ghost. Seven sons of Sceva thought it was a joke. That demon said, Paul I know. Jesus I know. Who are you? Because the thing had more power. You can't en engage the enemy with no power. What it really said was, Jesus I know and Paul I've heard about. The fame of Paul is spread around because Paul's got Holy Ghost power. But I'm looking in your soul and you know what I don't see? I don't see no Holy Ghost. The Bible said beat all seven guys to a pulp, one demon. This is real warfare. This is real. Whenever you're getting some entity getting the upper hand on you in the, in the natural realm, you're feeling oppressed and somebody dominating you and somebody at work putting something on you, you need to go and get some more power. You need more power because that witchcraft working spirit at your job from Louisiana that came into Atlanta after the hurricane brought that Louisiana witchcraft with her. <laughs> and her mama, a root worker and a two-headed woman from Louisiana, and she know the stuff. She got the stuff in her locker at the, at the job. She got the oil and the powder. She get there at 6 o'clock. Y'all do it at 7.30. She come in at 6 o'clock and spray that oil, that oil and powder down in the office. She all got all under your desk. You put your feet in the oven every day. Don't even know what it is. She done put that oil under your desk. And you leave work depressed. And feeling kind of weak. And I'm kind of lightheaded. You got that with Louisiana witch working with you. And people laugh. They think it's something to play with. This is the real deal going on. It ain't about who's got power. It's about who has more power. He's given us all power over all the power of the devil, but you got to be filled with the Holy Ghost to get that power. There's some people that seek the devil like you seek God. God at the club, and that girl done spent all night bathing in that red oil. They put that red oil all up in her vagina, so when you come and she come inside of her, you become her captive. Now put that red lust oil on her, now you become a zombie. Don't know what to do. She got you drunk with the power of that oil up in her vagina. And you had the audacity to go in, up inside that girl thinking you were some kind of master lover. And to become demon possessed and tied to her through that power of witchcraft with that red jink oil. And thinking it's a joke. You think that's real. I see it got you. It got, it got you. It got you. We're dealing with spiritual entities and powers down here. And people invoke these powers to control other people. Sex magic is real. They teach you the tricks of sex magic. Did you not know oral sex is part of sex magic? The Bible says don't eat the things sacrificed to an idol. That's what you're doing through oral sex. And bodily fluids exchanged have always been witchcraft. You get a Haitian girl down here in South Miami. I was in the military, man. I saw these guys affected by these Haitian girls. Don't eat the spaghetti. They put menstrual blood in it, urine in it. The sauce tastes real good because the tomato sauce smothered the real taste of what they put in it. And you lose your mind. See, the ones that practice it, the voodoo practitioners and folks from Haiti, they know I'm telling the truth. They know it's real because they know their mama did, their grandmama did, and talked to them. And you're trying to figure out what's wrong with this dude. Man, you can't shake this girl. This girl sleeping with everybody on the base, and you in love with her. What's wrong with you? I don't know, man. I'm, I'm drunk in love, man. I'm just, I can't shake that babe, man. She just got me, man. He ate the spaghetti. Your mama told you, you eat over everybody the house, didn't she? Didn't your mama tell you that growing up? Child, don't you eat over everybody the house because the people put some stuff on you. A lot of girls don't become lesbians eating that witch's brew. Thinking that girl was your friend, she done fed you some stuff and she was a lesbian. Next thing you know, you get up liking women. This is real because she put a demon in you. And see, folk get mad when they even bring up de demons. They get mad. I get all kinds of letters about people hating demons. Talking about, see, you should focus on the Lord only. 
And then they say, all you talk about is demons. Now, all the messages I done preach in my life and all I ever talked about was demons. But you know what's doing that in them? A demon. A demon don't want you talking about demons. See, man, this is a warfare. It's interdimensional. It's metaphysical. It's supernatural. And it's extraterrestrial. It comes from another world, from outer space. It's coming across a dimensional plane. We're warring against these entities. When you see crazy on the earth, there's a warfare in the heavens. In Washington, D.C., it's frenetic warfare in the atmosphere of Washington right now. You better believe that. Because entities are vying for what? Power. The political spectrum in America is not about taking care of the poor, blacks, homosexuals, all the stuff they tell you they're fighting for. We're fighting for your rights and all. That's a lie. They're fighting for power to see who has access to the money. The health care bill is not about your health care. It's about who is going to get paid. That's, every, that's all it's about. If you see congressmen and senators hating Trump care, it's because their constituencies that support them were getting the money from Obamacare. And they got the money from that and now you're trying to take it from us and give it to somebody else. It don't have nothing to do with you. Homosexual agenda is about how much money homosexuals spend. You think the NBA and the NFL really cares about homosexuals? But if they spend a lot of money at those games, we're gay friendly up in here. And don't you say anything about them because they are our peoples. You hear? <laughs> the WNBA is a lesbian domain. Look, trace the money. At the root of all evil is the love of money. You really think these people care about you and your and your welfare and your well-being no it's about where the money is flowing laws are passed to determine where the money is going democrats and republicans fight about who's getting the money it don't have nothing to do with me and you they could care less about me or you my buddy is getting paid and he's paying into my campaign coffers so therefore i'm repaying him by making sure he gets this contract this defense contract because he gave me a lot of money he makes little doodads and widgets. And this is a $10 million contract that the military uses. To, they need to make these little screws to go into an F-35 fighter. My friend makes the widgets, so therefore I'm making sure his, he gets this contract so he can make this one little widget to go into this F-35 and it's gonna pay him $10 million. And he gives me a million dollars in my campaign every two years. You see, that's how it works. It's all a big Ponzi scheme. And they make you believe they care about you. And you marching around with signs, yelling and screaming, supporting people. Can't you see that the Clintons have become filthy rich off of this? It's a game. Foreign entities give to everybody because they're buying what? Inroads into the economy. China wants to import. Korea wants to import. Japan wants to import. They got lobbyists for a reason up there because they're looking out for what? The person they work for. Pharmaceutical companies are a trillion dollar business. They want the FDA to approve this drug. So I got to lobby the Congress. Everything is about the money. It's not about me and you. No one cares about you. You better get to God through Jesus Christ. Change kingdoms because this kingdom down here is one of larceny, stealing, killing, and destroying, using you, pimping you, playing you like a pawn in a chess game. That's all it does. Don't get it wrong. Like the young people said, don't get it twisted. The devil doesn't love anybody. The devil is an equal opportunity hater. He hates everybody the same. He even hates the people he uses. 
when he gets through with them, he kills them and throws them away. Right. He hates every human because you remind him of God you're created in his image. He hates God, so he hates the human race. He uses humans. He loves no one. After he uses you and gives you what he gives you to use you, then he destroys you and throws you away. Squeeze all the lemon juice out, discard the whole, throw it away. That's what the devil's doing. So me and you have to get smarter and come all the way out from amongst them. Yeah. See, he didn't come, he didn't say come halfway out from amongst them. He said come out from amongst them and touch not the unclean thing. And under those conditions, God says, I'll receive you unto myself. To init, I see, I'm trying to tell you what we got to do to initiate a productive air war. You can't pray with your claws still in the world, still and having some type of a pony in the race in the world. You got to segregate, separate, sanctify to get power to pray through. If not, you'll ground yourself out. You'll have no power because you got ground wires holding him at the prayer. We got to totally come out from amongst them. Stop being attached to other people that are not going. I don't care if it's your husband, your wife, your sister, your brother, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. If they're not going, it has to become your deal now. I don't know about you, but I'm sanctifying myself and I'm going for the gusto. But, 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 but what? Were you Elmer Fudd or somebody? Start all that stuttering and stumbling around. I'm going. I don't know what you're going to do. That's how you got to approach this thing because in the final climax of everything, you're going to stand before that judgment seat alone. And God ain't going to ask you nothing about your husband or your wife. That terrifies dep dependent people. When you're a woman sitting home with three or four kids and, and your husband's not saved or not going, you hear that and you got to downgrade what you do because you know instinctively I don't have any way to take care of myself. And if I go with God 100%, my husband will be offended. A lot of folks try to attack this ministry and, and preaching when I'm preaching because they know back in the house it's going to cause some problems. We're not downgrading this for your house, I'm sorry. Amen. You better make up your mind what kingdom you're in. Amen. If your husband don't have the guts to do this, that's his problem. If you make it your problem, don't try to make it my problem. Amen. Price is too hard. They all just talk about war. My husband is saying we need to find a place that shows more love. It, it, there's not enough love here. And see, this war talk is not germane to God because God is a God of love, not war. You better read Ecclesiastes. There's a time for peace and a time for war. A time for love and a time for hate. It, I mean, everything's coming to Ecclesiastes. Everything blows and changes, man. It, it varies with God. And right now, you can see by the environment we're in, it's a time for war. Because they're not backing off of us this time. If Hillary Clinton had gotten to the White House, you'd have a target on your back right now for hate speech. Hate speech for preaching the gospel. Do not preach Leviticus 18. Do not preach Romans chapter 1. That's hate speech. I'm reading it from the Bible. I don't care about your so-and-so Bible. And they be cussing the Bible. You can take that Bible and stick it where the sun don't shine for all I care. You hateful Christians. You didn't hear Bernie Sanders interviewing that Christian guy? Saying that your beliefs are not compatible with, with, with American culture and American life? We're not here to be compatible with American life. We're here to preach the gospel. Saying you believe all Muslims and Jews are condemned? Yes. The Bible says, there is no other name given amongst men whereby ye must be saved. That's it. Anybody that does not come under the banner of Jesus Christ is condemned. The Bible says you're condemned already. The wrath of God abides on the wicked. There is only one name given. There is no plan B, Hindu, Buddhist. I don't care what banner you come under, Hare Krishna, if you don't come under the blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ, you are condemned. 
We are not authorized to change that one iota for anybody, including Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is not God. Oprah is not God telling you, well, I know it has to be other ways beside Jesus. God would never just leave one way to get to him with all these different religions. What if you were born a Buddhist? You got to be born again. What if you were born a Muslim? You got to be born again. What if you were born a Jehovah's Witness? You got to be born again. What if you were born as a Baptist? You got to be born again. It's only one way. You got to be born again. The Bible says if you're not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Neither can you enter into it. I don't care what religious structure you were born in. You must be born again. So Oprah's limited mind and limited scope is not the arbiter of anything because she don't know because she's flying by blind. She don't know. The carnal mind is always trying to know more than God and stand against the Bible ignorantly, unable to understand what's being said. So they use their own thought processes to try to determine what's true. You better get in the word of God. All of us have been alive long enough to have read the word of God all the way through at least one time. Yep. How much do you know about the Bible? You, how, how long have you been alive? How many books have you read outside of the Bible? How can the Bible sit here 66 books strong, never having been read by you at least one time? One time. <laughs> the first five books of the Bible give you a historical basis for the rest of the Bible. A lot of that is history. What happened historically? You've got to get a foundation laid in you and let God build upon that foundation. Stories about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob mean something. Because then you understand how Jesus was developed and where he came from and his lineage and how God worked through all of those situations to get to Jesus in the New Testament. Everything is valid. Every word has meaning in the Bible. Study the Bible. Pull it apart. Get to know the God that wrote the Bible and his son that he sent to save us. You do yourself a severe disservice being ignorant of the Bible. If you read the Bible through, it will change you all by itself. A lot of things that you stand against and you question will go away all by itself because it will reprogram your thinking processes. People sit in church ignorant of the Bible, getting preached at all day. And they don't have the discipline to go home, sit down with an open Bible, and read it. Read it. Before you talk against it, read it. There is nobody more ignorant than a person that argues against something ignorant of the, of the, mat, of the matter. You don't have any understanding of the data you're arguing against, and yet you argue against it. I can't believe God would do that. I don't believe God would. Have you read it? You can't believe anything about God or for God if you, if you never read it. You got to read it. We are turning back people to self-discipline for you to be responsible for you because you're going to stand alone at that judgment seat representing only you. There'll be nobody with you. You're going to stand, you're going to call people into that room one at a time and give, you got to give account for what? Every deed done in your mortal body. The Bible says every word you speak will be brought into judgment, but alone with the spotlight on you standing before that throne. Heels locked together. He's going to go through your life. And remember, God is not subject to time. It don't make, it don't make a difference how long it takes. Because he's eternal. He's outside of time. There is no long time with God because God knows nothing about time. He just exists. So he's going to microscopically pick apart all the hundreds of billions of people that have been on this planet. He's going to take time to pick apart every one of them. And you're going to account for everything you've done. Now, if you got the bad stuff under the blood, he won't even bring it up. So I'm trying to get all the way under the blood. Amen. So, got nothing against me. I don't have nothing on my record. Do I? Do I? I got nothing on my spotless. I think I'm spotless. <laughs> You want to be standing up there with some insurance knowing you hadn't done anything wrong. It's bad to walk in there wondering. I'm going to hope. I sure hope. Let me go on in here. 
Stand there with your knee, trembling, not knee not together. He call your name, Dad. Yes. I never knew you. Oh Lord. I never knew you. Depart from me, you work of iniquity. I've never known you. You said in church all this time, going through all these motions. I've never ever one day of your life known you. And that'd be a and see, we're taking everything lightly. But a heart attack comes in moments. A car wreck happens in milliseconds. And you're standing there. You live, some people live 30 years, they're gone. They answer it, they answer for what they did in their mortal bodies. You can leave here any, anywhere along the scale you can leave. And people live like they're not going to leave. You better recalibrate your thinking and take this thing seriously. God is not spending all this time talking to folk for no reason. You know how much time God has spent talking to people? You think he's talking to them for no reason? He's trying to show them you better change while you got time. That air war is first. You got to engage that air war in prayer and fasting to break down that dimensional plane, open these portals, and have God and the power of the angels come across. Don't fear it. It is absolutely necessary. Revelation 12. Revelation 12, verse 7, and there was a war in heaven. Michael, here he is again, powerhouse Michael and his angels. Michael and his angels. There are angels that belong to Michael's armada. He has assigned angels. He's an archangel commanding angels. It's hierarchy in every part of God's kingdom. Anybody tell you there's no hierarchy in the church is crazy when he says in Hebrews 13, be subject to those that have rule over you. I think he says it about three times. Amen. How can there be no hierarchy? And he's commanding you to be subject to those that have rule over you. For they watch for your souls. And then somebody ignorant of the word of God tells you, we're, we're all the same. We're all under Jesus and there is no hierarchy. That's ignorance talking to you. Don't listen to it. Look at this. Revelation 12, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and who? You mean to tell me the dragons got angels? He took a third of them when he fell. He's got an entourage. He's got a war, a, bu a bunch of warlords, fallen angels, that engage Michael and his angels. This is the air war that's going to go on now. And prevailed not, neither was their place found in, in, anymore in heaven. This is not a past tense war. This is a futuristic war. Because the devil is in the second heaven is now around the celestial dome. Trying to do what? Safeguard those portals. He's got an angelic martyr around the globe. Making sure no portals open up to allow the power of God to flood in. That's why he's up there. He wants to limit your prayers going up and he doesn't want the answers coming down. Remember what happened in Jacob's time? He laid his head on the rock and what happened? A ladder went up. And what was going up and down on the ladder? Angels were going up and down, ascending and descending on the ladder. And then it says in the New Testament that ladder is Christ. So if your mind is set above or your mind stays on the Lord, then that ladder going to begin to ascend out of your head and the angels will begin to come up and down on that ladder. So the devil doesn't want that ladder to go up. So you got what? Communion. You got communication with God. That's what he's trying to stop. So he tries to distract you where? On the horizontal. He's trying to get your mind off of God. Get your mind off of what you're doing. Get your mind off of what you're praying. Get your mind off the word of God. Anything not to think heavenly thoughts because now you're communing with God. And he don't want that to happen, man, because he knows sooner or later you're going to become a replica and representation of God on this planet. So God's way of doing it is to cut off all the horizontal from you. So you can't be what? Distracted. It's funny to see people under the rest. They think about God all the time. Folk that have fun never think about God. You think about God all day long when you're under the rest. But when you got everything made, God's on the back burner. 
Why somebody severely ill in the hospital, they think about the Lord. Oh, they got a Bible in there with them now. Go to jail, now they, they get jailhouse converted. I just been here singing some spiritual songs up in the jail cell. I was singing and praying to the Lord. When you're under duress, you, you look toward heaven. When you're living in a lap of comfort, you kind of lay back and cool it. Discipline yourself to seek heaven when you're comfortable. God won't, God's not putting you under duress for nothing. If he, if he chases you, it's because he sees you drifting off. Don't, don't have to undergo chasing. Just stay in. I'm just, I'm just seeking you no matter what. I got a disciplined regimen I follow where I seek the Lord and I stay in line and I keep pursuing you. And I don't need you to hit me upside my head because I'm doing it anyway. That's how you, that's what Daniel was. That's why the Bible calls Daniel a man that was greatly beloved because he had a self-discipline to seek the Lord all the time. So he says this dragon and Michael and Michael fought with their angels. And the dragon and his angels prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. So I told you, now he's cast down to earth level. And his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. And the power of his Christ. When the devil's cast down, now we're seeing a culmination of events. For the accuser of our brethren is what? Cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him, the dragon and his armada of angels. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. Wait a minute, I thought Michael threw him down. Well, who empowered Michael? Us. With the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, not loving our lives to death, it initiated what? An air war that caused the dragon and his angels to be cast down and removed as a barrier. Now, salvation will be wrought on this planet as the devil comes forth enraged that's that's revelation 12 right notice how when the devil hit the earth immediately revelation 13 came into being because the next thing you see is a beast rising up out of the sea what happened the devil got in the antichrist because he's on ground level now now he raises up a man he changed tactics my first objective was to block up the portal so god couldn't interact with with earth I've been cast down and removed. Now I'm going to fight God from earth level. So he raises up an antichrist to fight God from earth level because the barrier in the heavens has been cast down. This makes perfect sense. So now we change from an air war to a ground war. We're approaching the casting down of the dragon. The next thing on the agenda will see the dragon cast down. And you're going to experience an atmosphere of change on earth. The Antichrist spirit that is now down here working on people. Why is the Antichrist spirit down here? What's it doing right now? Making preparations for the dragon to come. It's programming people to follow men. Because it knows the Antichrist will come. And you got to be pre-programmed to put your trust and faith in a man. That's why you got the Creflo Dollars and the T.D. Jakes and all these Joel Osteens and all these men and the president and the pope. All that's about getting ready for the Antichrist. Louis Farrakhan, putting your trust and hope in a man. Cursed is the man that makes flesh his arm and his heart departs from the Lord. They're being prepared for Antichrist. Because the dragon's coming down. He'll enter into a man, the son of perdition. The devil will stand up embodied and enfleshed as the antithesis of Christ. And the people are already prepared as sodomites, homosexuals, transgenders, lesbians, freaks, kooks, wackos, porno addicts, drug addicts, filthy, ready to follow their king, the Antichrist. 
I'm telling you what's going to happen, what, not, not what I think is going to happen. The words are sure and they will come to pass. So right now you need to get ready to be the antithesis of the Antichrist, stand with Christ and war against the powers of Antichrist. Can't you feel the forces around you that don't want you to take this thing to the limit? It does not want you to fulfill the call on your life. It does not want you full of the Holy Ghost. What spirit is that? That's the spirit of Antichrist. It does not want Christ formed in you. And the apostle says in Galatians chapter 2, I'm laboring with you. I'm striving with you until Christ be formed in you. Antichrist does not want Christ formed in you. It wants me to be quiet. Be a pacifist. Don't talk so loud. Don't proclaim this over the world wide web. The devil is a liar. We're going to proclaim it loud and clear. And only the saints of God can hear it. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear. Everybody can't hear it. Because they have that antichrist cholesterol clogging up their earlobe. They are looking for a man. They're looking for denominational membership. They're looking for the Pope. They're looking for, the, for anybody, an imam in a Muslim mosque. Anybody, a man in flesh, Donald Trump, Hillary, I'm with her. See, it's always flesh. You bring up Jesus, you pick up conflict. Bring up the flesh, they follow, they love you. Sports heroes, LeBron James. Anybody but Christ. This thing is a deadly deal, man. Tom Brady is my man. Aaron Rodgers is top dog to me. He's using anything he can to get your affections on flesh and a man in preparation to receive the son of perdition, the Lord of destruction and calamity, the Antichrist. The dragon is on his way down here. Oh, I'm right. It's right. It's dead right. You don't see 10,000 folk in here. They're packing out the hell centers. They're in the hell holes being bundled to be burned. It's a narrow way. Few there be that find it. Most people will bow the knee to the Antichrist. They're already sodomites to accommodate him. He's the king of Sodom. Abraham was accosted by the king of Sodom before Mel Melchizedek came. The king of Sodom says, give us the souls, we'll give you the riches. That's the deals they make in churches. The pastors are selling out the souls for the money. They represent who? The king of Sodom. The church is full of sodomites, practicing oral sex with their husbands and wives. You're a sodomite preparing to be burned. You're damned to hell as a sodomite. Israel, no sodomite ever could any time cohabitate with Israel. Anytime sodomites came in their midst, all of God's power left them. Ichabod, we, I can't interact with you until you get those sodomites out of here. See, sodomy is not just sodomy. Oral says and anal says is worshiping a sodomite god. That's worship of Baal. That's the worship of Ashtoreth. You had temple whores that would do anything because they represented sodomite gods and goddesses. That's what's on people. That's what pornography is. Pornography is the celebration of sodomy. Sodomites and pornography would do anything. It's nothing to have woman-on-woman -woman sex in, in, in pornography because they're sodomites. You see how that spirit is transferred to a whole generation of young women and now the older women? They are sodomites. Can't you see in Romans chapter 1, the last phase before reprobation is sodomy. Homosexuality comes before reprobation. When you went into homosexual activity, whether it was practicing oral and anal sex with the opposite gender, or being engaged in same-sex operations, you were prepared for reprobation. 
Nobody has an appetite to eat body waste from another human unless you've been driven insane. You've been made into a reprobate, a castaway that can't be saved. The devil is reprobate. You can't save him. His mind is reprobate. And remember, he says, I, he gives them, he gave them up to uncleanness. He gave them up to vile affection. He gave them over to reprobation. That means God is through with you. You pray for that person, God will tell you, stop praying for them. I have nothing to do with them. I'm not saving them. They're damned. They're out of my economy. They can't repent. They're given over. He says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he turns them over to a strong delusion that they will believe a lie for one reason, that they might be damned. Everybody who did not love what? The truth. the truth. But they had pleasure in what? Unrighteousness. Unrighteousness. This thing is dead right. I'm dead on it, man. This is right. They are being prepared to receive the Antichrist. When your brother or your sister stands against the Christ you know, they are full of the spirit of Antichrist. They joined the sorority and fraternity and took on the spirit of Antichrist. They became a Mason or an Eastern star and they became Antichrist. They hate Christ. No man, a Mason stand in the pulpit preaching out of the Bible with an Antichrist spirit. He told him in Acts, your fathers do always resist the Holy Ghost just like you. That's Antichrist. The word Christ means anointed. Anointed by whom? The Holy Ghost. They're anti-Holy Ghost. They're anti the Spirit of God. The word Messiah means anointed one. Anywhere the anointing of God shows up, they will hate it and hate you for bringing it. Get this thing settled in your mind once and for all. Don't leave here with any kind of disparities in your mind about it. Get this thing settled this morning here. Because the dragon is on his way. And I'm glad. Because that means this hell will come to an end. Mark chapter 16, the air war. Look at the ground war. After he arrived on the scene. Now we're ready to go. We're locked and loaded. We got an adversary in our presence now. It's, it's, it's undeniable what we got now. See, right now we got gray areas where everybody can play safe. But when that Antichrist comes to power, you know what's going to happen? You're going to get a mark of the beast to buy and sell. You got you to you make a choice. Fence is on fire. Jump right or left. Jump in or out. Choose. See, we need that to happen. Because folks in church can look saved and play saved right now. It's got to have a penalty and persecution attached to salvation so we can find out who's really saved. With no penalty and no persecution, anybody can play saved and pretend. That's why you got to make ready now for then. You got to get ready for a warfare that's on the ground with the human being governing himself over the masses as their king, but he's full of the dragon. That ain't just a man talking. The Bible tells you in Revelation 13, he received his power from the dragon. And they all followed after the beast. Everyone that did not have their name written in the book of life. Man, this thing is perfect. God has planned this thing out to the nth degree. Mark 16, verse 14, afterward he appeared unto the eleven. If they said it, meet and un upbraided them with their unbelief. And hardness of heart. Jesus got on them. He jumped on them because you didn't believe you had a hardened heart. Because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Here's the ground war. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned, Bernie Sanders. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. You anti-tongue talking folks. They shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing. That word take up is a misnomer. 
Because you got folk down in Arkansas trying to handle snakes. The Greek word take up means put away. They'll put away serpents. They'll control and, and command demons. They shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So you see now, you're starting off casting out devils, speaking with tongues, dominating devils, and then laying hands on the sick and see them recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. So if Jesus and God are the same person, he's sitting at the right hand of himself, one this Pentecostal. I love the IBC choir. They sing some nice songs, but they're one that's Pentecostal. They want to acknowledge that God is three persons. They say he's one person and emanates three ways. He sent at the right hand of himself. Well, that's a mystery. We can't understand it. That's pretty stupid. If God is turning to Jesus and saying, sit here until I make your enemies your footstool. If he's the same person, he has to tell himself that. Jesus said, nobody knows the, the, the time of the hour, not even the Son of Man, but God the Father only knows. Well, if he's the same person, he's blocking his mind off from himself. One that's Pentecostalism is stupid. Get out, forsake it, leave it alone. It's crazy. The Antichrist is always trying to fight what? The father and son relationship, the Bible says. He that has the son has the father. He that has not the son has not the father and has not life. Three persons who are one. They're not, that's nothing more than telling you they're unified. The oneness is not one person. The oneness is oneness in unity. You got one family. Father, son, and mother. They're unified. They're a family. God is a family unit. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He's an eternal family. That's all it is. The, the fact that man is in God's image is the fact that God made families. He started with Adam and Eve. They came together and made the third person, the, the child. And that's the reflection of the image of God. God is a universal governing family that has always governed the universe eternally. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It ain't even a big mystery if you understand it. The family is the reflection of God and his family that governs the whole universe as one unified, indestructible family that can't be separated because they're always of one accord. God the Father is the head and the planner of the family. God the Son is the Lord that speaks for the Father. The Holy Ghost performs what the Son speaks. He's the power arm of the family. God plans it, Jesus says it, the Holy Ghost does it. That's how it operates. This ain't even rocket science. A child could see this. Look how much turmoil it causes. A big argument about how can three be one. I just explained all of that to you in less than two minutes. That's how, that's how pitiful it is. The simplicity of it is what's complicating it to a carnal mind. It's so simple they can't see it. He hides himself where? In plain sight. But your mind has got to be spiritual. And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them. And confirming what? Benny Hinn don't start working miracles if there's no word. He confirms the word with signs following. We're in preparation now. He's amalgamating this army. He's getting those dry bones put together. Next will come the flesh and the sinews. Then it's going to prophesy to the wind and breathe into that body and stand it up as what? A mighty army, a great army. That's when you got the body ministry of God raised up to contend against the dragon infused army of the Antichrist. We're going to approach a conflict. As the dragon hits this world, as he comes down to the terrestrial plane, God's going to raise up that body of Christ as the antithesis of the dragon army. And now we got absolute ground level conflict, a ground war. It's perfect. You waited your whole life for this if you're really born again. 
if you're really born again, you waited your whole life to see this conflict. So you're seeing the age come to an end. Luke chapter 24. The Luke chapter 24 revelation here gives us more insight. Verse 36. And as, and as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed suppose that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. So you see a glorified body, what it's made of. Flesh and bones with no blood. Because normally you see when the Bible talks about a human, it's flesh and blood. He says flesh and bones. You got a skeletal frame with flesh on it, a different kind of flesh, glorified flesh with no blood in your body. He poured his blood out. Why the life of the flesh is the blood. You don't need that because now you got a spiritual body. You got a metaphysical body now that don't need blood. You don't have to breathe oxygen anymore. You're a whole nother kind of different creature. I was kidding around with Barbara last night. I said, I wonder when you have female body parts like breast and stuff in heaven. She said, it won't be no need for them, really. So you're right. You won't need no sexual organs because you ain't going to have no sex. I said, I wonder if the Lord will let me and you stay together in heaven because we're just good friends or whatever. Would he care? I said, I don't think he'd care if we still hung out in heaven together. We go and look at Jupiter, and Mars, and Pluto, galaxies. See what's really in the Milky Way for real and everything. We go to the sun and stand on the sun. <laughs> but the sun will be put out. The Bible said the sun gonna be extinguished. He or he'll probably replace it with something. That'll probably be something. God is a creator. He probably keep on creating right on anyway. They say in heaven, people who have gone there and seen it, it's absolute true color. Everything is brilliant color. Like blue is super blue. Green is super green. You know. I bet that's some, you know, I, I'd like to just get out of here and see all of this, man. It piques your interest when you hear about heaven, streets made of gold and all that kind of stuff. Man, there's so much more to live for than this. You're living to live again. We got to get out of here and our minds have to get out of here and stop making this your home and this being the totality of your existence. He, he's got flesh and bones. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. So Jesus' hands and feet are eternally wounded. Those, those wounds never heal up. Jesus will be in heaven forever with that hand, those hand wounds, those, those, those foot wounds, and those wounds around his head. That way nobody can ever say anything about Jesus again. See, the devil made claims against Jesus. The word of God is who he hated. Matter of fact, what happened was, since Jesus was the eternal son of God, Satan got jealous of him being the governor of heaven. I'm just as beautiful. I'm illuminated. I'm a magnificent, magnificent cherub of my angel. Why does he have to tell everybody what to do? That same spirit in Antichrist comes to the church. Who put them in charge? Who are they to tell me what to do? That's the very nature of Satan. Read Isaiah 14 and all those statements about I will. He's talking about Jesus. That's who he hated. Because he is your son. And I'm a creature. And he's above me telling me what to do. I don't like command structure, I don't like hierarchy, and I don't like him being Lord over me. That's the, Jesus Christ is the focal point even back before time began on earth. That cherubim angel was jealous of him. He envied him. That's the very nature of the Antichrist spirit, envy. The Bible says the Pharisees and Sadducees killed Jesus because of envy. That was the Antichrist spirit in them. They envied the fact that he was the son of God. That's the problem. When you hate God's government, you hate Jesus Christ and his lordship. The very nature of a Jezebel spirit in a woman is to stand against proper government. She fights a man's authority 
because she's got an antichrist spirit that hates any governmental authority that represents God. Man, wake up and find out what we're really fighting against now before you fall prey to it. And this world teaches a woman to rise up in rebellion. And you're going to be crushed to death by Jesus himself as he destroys you. I don't care how pretty you think you are. I don't care how much you're slaying. The slayer will slay the slayer. Jesus Christ didn't impress by no pretty face. He's going to crush you and send you to hell with all that 36, 23, 36. You make a bad mistake trying to somehow seduce the son of God. I perceive that thou art a prophet. Girl, you've had five husbands. The one you got now is not your own. Had to impress him one inch. Batting them baby browns in his face. There's a lot of women going to be damned. There's a lot of women in hell tonight thinking my body talks louder than my words. And no man going to stand against this when I put this thing on them. Man, they, hey, you got the wrong man. There's a man from heaven that ain't impressed by you not one inch. If that man gets into a man down here, he'll be just like the man from heaven and not be impressed by you either. You make a bad mistake thinking everybody is a vagina worshiper. Everybody ain't. God can knock all that out of you. As a matter of fact, if a man been captivated long enough by that vagina, he'll begin to hate women. That's why the rappers hate them right now, because they hate anything that's imprisoned them. The lust for a woman makes a man hate a woman. Because he knows this woman has weakened me. I can't stop falling for her because of the lust in me, and I despise her because she took my manhood, and I'm weak for the vagina. And I hate you. While I lust after you. I'm in the strip joint hating the strippers. But I got to have them feed my lust. And call them hoes. And female dogs. While still trying to get them to lay up with them. And despising them. It's a kingdom built from hatred. Not love. A seducing woman trying to seduce a man. Can't love the man because she's disempowered. The man is crippling him. I just want to flex this power over you. With this thing between my legs dominating you, you weak punk. And it's a kingdom built on hatred. And when you grovel between the legs and eat of the orifice, you're the ultimate weak chump and a punk with no guts. I broke him down to the level of eating from the orifice that I dispatched body waste from. I broke him all the way down. Look at the dog. I got him. Of kingdom built of hatred. Because the devil's form of love is hatred. He's a man, a, a, a being that operates in opposites. What God is, God is love. Therefore, the devil is hatred. They come together to get married based on hatred and seduction. That's why the mess don't last. You hate that which dominates you. If your lust binds you to a woman to the degree she dominates you, you will come to despise them. That's why they beat on you. That's why they treat you like trash. That's why they dog you. Because they hate you. And the music confirms the fact they hate you. Look what they call you in the music. Hoes and female dogs and sluts and you name it. Because these homosexual guys hate you. Who made them a homosexual? You did. By performing oral sex on them. When you begin to perform oral sex on that man, you made him into a sodomite, a homosexual. He don't even like women. Now he's looking for a man. The last stop before becoming a lesbian is a man with a woman's spirit in him. You get a soft, feminine man that you can dominate and castrate, but that won't satisfy you because you don't have woman's body parts. He performed oral sex on you, making you into a lesbian and you're trying to be with a soft man to accommodate you but that ain't gonna fulfill you that woman right there is what you want now because oral sex has no gender oral sex is a neutered sex because what happens is androgynous a mouth has no gender so now you became a lesbian because that man performed oral sex on you and you got you started with a soft man you could dominate you married him 
and now your girlfriend and you got drunk one night, next thing you know, you're waking up with in her arms. Lady came to my wife talking about, well, my, my girlfriend spent the night downstairs sometime when we've been out together, and as soon as my husband leaves, she come get in the bed with me. See, they try to play this bisexual thing. The players in the street will tell you, the guys, tell you, they run with bisexual women everywhere because they want to be with two or three women at a time. Them girls ain't bisexual, they lesbian. You just a trinket that happen to be around in the bed with them, buddy. They like each other. You wonder why that man became a homosexual? Because you performed oral sex on him and a mouth has no gender. Now the guy at the grocery store is just as valid as a sexual partner. And the devil created the kingdom of sodomites to prepare for the dragon and he used oral sex to do it. People hate when I mention this because the demon in you is governing you to the degree that you fight it because you've been inundated by the devil's antichrist spirit already. You better repent, forsake, and beg God to get that out of you. Or you will be damned. I give you my word. You will be damned as a sodomite. And you better wake up. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, have you here any meat? So you know now in a glorified body you can eat meat. And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and, a, and a, of a honeycomb. Broiled fish and a honeycomb? Man. And he took it and did eat before them. You, now, now look what you got. I got a dead man sitting in front of me eating some fish. I saw this man die the other day. And now he's sitting in front of me eating fish. You know what that looks like? Your Uncle Leroy died three weeks ago and he's at your kitchen table eating fish with you. That's kind of terrifying. A dead man eating fish in a honeycomb. Man. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Look at this now. They've been with him all the time now. And after he's raised from the dead, he opened the, the, the scriptures to them. So you can understand what it meant and what it said. The scripture is given by way of revelation coming through the Holy Spirit. You can't read the Bible and understand it. It must be revealed to you because it's a supernatural book. And said unto them, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance and washing away of sins. And you are witnesses of these and behold I send the promise of my father upon you but tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Wait until you got power to go and do this. Don't run out and do it, wait until you're endued with power from on high in heaven. You need the Holy Ghost before you do one thing for God that's productive. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you'll mentally ascend to having some kind of spiritual power and you're just like a clanging cymbal making noise. Your prayers carry no power because you don't have the baptism in the Holy Ghost for real. You just imagine you got him. When you got the Holy Ghost, that dynamo comes into you, man, and turns on. It'll churn up well up in you. Yeah. We were down at the conference. They da danced my wife around in the, in the conference like a rag doll. She wasn't trying to do that. He got a hold of her, like they used to say. When you got that thing in you, like a uh, shabby used to say, he'll tip over that honey bucket. Next thing you know, man, you, you out there. But you don't really have it. All you do is try to act like you got the Holy Ghost. Your Holy Dance looks stiff. You too stiff. To, your Holy Dance, yeah. That's you. That ain't nothing but you. Look at you. You look stiff. You're like a cripple. You ain't right. Ain't it? See, you, see, when you try to work it up, it's just raggedy all the way through the process. Go and tarry until you really get endowed with power from on high for real. And stop kidding your crazy self. And he led them out as far as to Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was, par he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. 
tarrying until. That's what they were doing. They were going to wait, man. They went to that upper room finally, man. They were pursuing and praying until that portal opened and the Holy Ghost flushed down on them. We've got to go back to tarrying. Don't let people persuade you and get you away from tarrying. They try to dissuade you and push you back from it. Don't let them do it. Tarrying until you really got power that came from heaven that empowered that word in you to walk this thing out. What happened in Acts chapter 1? Famous Acts 1 8. What, what happened when, when, the, when this thing had when come to pass? He says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. He said that back in Luke, and it happened in Acts. As you get to Acts chapter 2, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord, all with one accord in one place. This is why we want a dunamis tabernacle, a place of tarrying. When folks are born again, you've got an atmosphere for them to receive the Holy Ghost, bathed in prayer, taught to tarry until. This thing has got to go back to being on one accord in one place as a unified body of believers. The devil is terrified of this message. He hates this because he does not want unity in the Christian community. Community means common unity. The common denominator is Jesus Christ that unifies us together. Not doctrine, not somewhere you were born, not your race or culture. Jesus makes us a community of believers. And the Holy Ghost will come there when he sees that unity. So you see now, when that day had fully come, he came like a rushing mighty wind and filled everybody there and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Last scripture, Mark chapter nine. Mark chapter nine. The ground war. What happens? We got right now set up on this earth. A conglomeration of demon-possessed people. You can't tell this. I don't know what to tell you. They said and listen to all that hip-hop and rap, and they become demon-possessed. They walk down the street. You see them walking down the street, their hands just moving and their mouth moving with earbuds in. Just. You try to talk to them, they're just discombobulated. Their minds are scattered. Their minds are crazy. Try to sit in class and do a math problem with your mind like that. Try to understand history or geography with your mind like that. You can't even retain the knowledge that you're given with your mind like that. They become discombobulated morons exposed to this gibberish every day. The TV shows, the movies, all the filth that's coming out of mind right now. We need power now to overcome this. The ground war is designed to rescue those that are held captive by the devil. The dragon is coming to contend with us at ground level. Now we need the body to stand up. We've been given all power over all the power of the devil. Nothing is going down until God is ready to wrap up the age. But until then, we're given to contend against the devil and take his captives away from him. We need people that will become soldiers to go against this antichrist spirit. Notice now the contrast. You got the spirit of Christ in you. They've got the spirit of Antichrist in them. That's the conflict zone. Now you're contending for the souls held captive by the Antichrist spirit. And you have the spirit of Christ to set them free. That's why you need power. Because the thing that's in their mind is the spirit of Antichrist that's got them captivated. So we got to have the ability to do what? Bind in heaven. What we bound on earth. So God can loose in heaven what we're loosed on earth. That's power. That's contention. That's conflict going on. As we're taking the kingdom by force. From the days of John the Baptist, a man baptized in the Holy Ghost, until now. The kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. And the violent take it by force. That's why people don't like war talk. We're too angry. You're angry. You're combative. You're mad. Seems like everybody in this church is so angry. Nobody I know in here is angry. But we're going to confront the devil. And we're gonna, not going to let empty-headed gibberish that's false just slide. 
You come with a lie, we're going to confront that lie. We're not going to go along to get along. Somebody's right, somebody's wrong. What you're saying is wrong. We're not going to give you a free pass. We're going to con earnestly contend for what? The faith that was once delivered unto us. We're not going to let the devil come in here and tell us a lie and just try to get along with him. What you believe is important. You've got to contend for the faith. Because the devil's always trying to make you not believe truth and lower your guard. What happens when you get this contention? Mark 9, 14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, what question you with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto, the, unto thee my son, which has a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he takes him, he tears him and, do, and, 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 and he foams and gnashes with his teeth and pines away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered them and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and, he went, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tore him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. Now this is Jesus confronting a demon. Right now, a person falls down, foaming at the mouth. They call it mysticism or something that's wrong. But when Jesus confronted the demon, he fell down foaming at the mouth. That's a natural conflict taking place between two different contrary entities. Demonic spirits will act crazy and do all kinds of crazy things when you confront them. But so what? All you want to do is cast them out and make them leave. He asked his father, how long is it ago since this came upon him? And he said of a child. So you see, children can be demonized. And oftentimes it cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. And if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. You'll find a lot of times when Jesus deals with a child, he goes through the parents. Because you're given to govern that child, he deals with the parents to get to the child. You let that thing into the home because of your conduct, you got to get right to get that kid free. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, a lot of times dumb and deaf spirits piggyback. You're, you can't talk because you can't hear. You're dumb because you're deaf. They hook together. If you can't hear, you can't learn how to talk. So a dumb and deaf spirit yokes itself together in your ears and in your mouth. Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. That's important. Come out and don't go back in. His words set up a barrier so the thing couldn't re-enter. Come out and don't come back in. That's the end of that. You can't, can't get in now because the word of God has sealed the boy. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one, he was as one dead in so much that, they, that many said, he is dead. So you're looking for a nice, clean, pristine environment dealing with demons? Look somewhere else because there's going to be a rusty, nasty warfare with demons. And to the degree they thought the boy was dead when the thing was cast out. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, this kind, there must be a particular kind that has more power and that is different from others. This kind come forth by nothing but by what? That tells us what we got to do. Universally, nationally, globally, we're dealing with this kind now. You ain't never seen demons like these. You've never seen people like these. Go to the store, go out to dinner, go for a walk through your neighborhood. You've got massive amounts of people demon possessed by this kind. It's another breed of demon down. It's a different kind of demon down here. This boy here was deaf and dumb and, and lunatic. He was, he was crazy too, getting thrown into the fire and into the water. 
The boy was out of his senses. He was crazy and deaf and dumb. A different kind of demon has come. That means me and you got to go to another level of power. And it comes by way of what? Prayer, Prayer and fasting. See, this is not something I got to say with a lot of effort and loud. Some people will do it. Some people won't. There's nothing you can do to make them do it. This thing got to be in you. When you say, I, I logically looked at it. I assessed the threat. I examined the situation. I'm logically going to enter into a time of fasting and prayer. Systematically, regimented, until I got power over all the power of these invaders. I'm going to do what's necessary to overcome this devil. Because without me doing that, there is no hope. You can talk about problems from now to doomsday. You can see your kid, you know your kid is lunatic friends, they're crazy. Something's got a hold of your son, something's got a hold of your daughter. You know you didn't raise that person. You know good and well you didn't raise that person. You raised them better than that. But a demon got in them. So you got to say, you know what, this kind has come upon my child. This kind is influencing my husband and wife. This kind is in the workplace. Somebody got to say, look, okay, I done talked until I'm all talked out. I done talked to that boy, talked to that girl till I'm exhausted. And you see them standing there like concrete. That ain't them. That's a demon. And if they went out and had sex with some kook, it reinforced and made the demon stronger. You lay down with one of these hip-hop guys or some old hip-hop whore, you're going to become just like granite. And you begin to take on the demeanor and the mindset, the intellect of the demonic world. Nobody goes and writes all over themselves with tattoos unless they've been demonized. You can see a person transform right before your very eyes into a demon-possessed person. And we just talking to them, trying to logically ask them, what's your problem? Why are you doing this? What? You're wasting your time. You're talking to a demon. You got to back out. Back out. Get back to your house. Turn your plate on over. Give your groceries away to your neighbors because they'll spoil in your refrigerator. <laughs> give, your, give your groceries away. I, I ain't going to be eating nothing. I won't be eating nothing. I'm going in. It might sound funny, but what I'm saying is the only way to defeat them. Amen. You can talk until you turn blue in the face and you black. It's hard for a black person to turn blue in the face. You talk until the blood draining from your eyes. You can cry a river of tears. That demon is still standing just like concrete. You can beg and plead that demon be just like concrete. Granted, you can't, you can't figure out for, your, for the life of you what's got a hold of this person. It's this kind. It's a ground war now because you read it in Joel. Palmer worms came in, canker worms, locusts, caterpillars, and the Bible calls it an invading army of demonic entities. They're here. What are they assigned to do? Prepare the world to receive the dragon. Your crazy son or daughter is being prepared to receive the dragon. And they'll turn on you and kill you when the dragon gets here. You better try to save them now. Because if they go reprobate, you can't save them. So what saints are going to, okay, okay. Price, okay, okay, I've heard enough. I've heard enough, Price. I'm stepping outside of the status quo in the main stream of religion. I'm going to personally accept myself to pray and fast like Daniel. It's going to initiate an air war. But we're, we're getting reinforcements sent down to us. Got, there's got to be a war up there so they can come on down. When the Holy Ghost hits you, you're going to feel it because he's going to come up in you and fill you from head to toe. He's going to fill you up with power. And if you, if you keep yourself sanctified, if you keep yourself separated, you're going to walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill any lust of your flesh. See, when you get little idiosyncrasies kind of flashing through your mind, your flesh trying to live. Little old stuff about people, you know. Oh, that's, that's your flesh trying to live. It'll make you think crazy thoughts because the flesh trying to live. Somebody get up and walk around. Woman walk through here. Felicia walk through the restroom. Tell Jerry, yeah, Felicia got a big butt. Look at her walking. Look at her walking in the aisle. Look at her, look at her butt. That's the devil trying to mess with her head, with his head. He'll tell you anything he can to mess with your head. 
But what about the person dying and riding on the vine out there that's demon possessed with this kind yoked to their soul? And you know that's not them. See, it's different when you raise somebody and know somebody. You know that's not them. You know that's another personality. That's not what I, I know that's not you. The answers you give me are not coming from you. It's coming from that dude you join yourself to. It came from that girl you join yourself to in that sexual soul tie. That's their logic. That's their mental acumen. That's their intellect talking. That's the words of a demon talking to me. Come in the house as a stranger. You don't even know who they are. Bag out. Get to a prayer closet. Turn that plate over. And get for real first yourself. Say, so God, you know what? I've been playing with you. I'm getting serious because I see the need. Now, I see this person that damn to hell unless somebody does something about it. I am that somebody. It's an all-volunteer army. What are we launching? An air war in prayer to break down these barriers that's preventing our reinforcements from coming so the Holy Ghost can come upon us and equip a ground force for a ground war. Those chariots of fire will come just like in Elijah's day. It's more of them with us than it is with them. Don't you know he just took a third of the angels? It's two-thirds left. We outnumber them two to one. Two to one, we got them beat. But somebody got to engage in an air war to fight a ground war to set the captives free. Who is willing to volunteer for this last expeditionary mission to set the captives free? You got to turn that plate over. The church of Jesus Christ is too fat because we eat like great dang dogs all the time and we don't sacrifice up for God to come upon us and move. You better get slimmed down, man, because you fasting and prayed your way into this new anointing you need to effectively stop the devil. The Antichrist is banking on the fact that when Jesus comes back, that he won't find faith on the earth. Jesus himself asked the question, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will somebody be found faithful, determined to see this thing happen? I'm not talking to a room full of 10,000 people. That's telling you, this thing is lean, man. It's lean, the people that would do this. Become one of them. Don't look right or left. Tell God, you know what? I'll, 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 I'll do this alone if necessary. God will come on one person. He'll change, he'll, he can change the whole world with one person. One Moses. One Joshua. But he wants his body to come together on one accord. Prayer will yoke us together. Same focus, same words. It's about a prayer war that initiates an air war that is going to settle down into a ground war so the end can come. It's time to wrap this up. It's time to see this thing come to pass. These demons think they have carte blanche. They made a bad mistake. They studied long. They studied wrong because God's got some folk. He's been deconstructing people for the last 10 years to get them ready for this. Now you've come to the end of the matter. Now it's time to take it to the next phase. He broke you down to fill you up. Now it's time to be filled up. We're going to engage these enemies on a productive mission to destroy the yokes of the devil. For this purpose, the Son of God is manifested in the flesh to destroy the works of the devil. One of the works the devil did was to bind your child. That's a work of the devil. You ought to get mad enough to stand up and say, no, devil, here, here to for you, we'll go no further. I'm stopping this right now. Today, I'm stopping this. I'm shutting all this down. And just standing like granite, man, and just turn that plate over and begin to seek God. You don't have to think, seek God, seek God, seek God. Knock, he'll open. Seek, you'll find. Ask, he'll give it to you. Just keep pounding heaven. As long as you stay in that realm of fasting and not gratifying flesh, God will come see you by and by. He's going to come. You get a universal body of Christ together on one accord doing that, he's going to come to, to the collective body to establish his will. Dunamis Tabernacle is going to stand up full of Holy Ghost folk that are not conscious of each other. Our pursuit is going to be vertical. See, if you're, not, if you're vertical, the people around you don't matter because I'm on a vertical mission. You're praying through for power. And you're not even conscious of your surroundings. There'll be no debates and arguments because I don't even know you're alive. I could care less.
people who keep on talking about the, the horizontal and what's going on and what you didn't do or what you didn't accomplish, what you said to me, they're not vertical people. Go vertical. Win the air war to have a productive ground war. This time for Christ to move and be seen and not us. If you would, stand to your feet, please, and we'll dismiss. We preach this long as a forerunner to Dunamis Tabernacle. This is not designed for you to sit. People here have to sit here through it because they're here. But by way of live stream, we do this for live stream so the message is going to be broken down into like 30 or 40 minute segments. So all week long up to next Sunday, you got food to feed on. You can break it down, study it. You let it minister you from day to day, 30 minutes at a time. Because it's a forerunner to have a place open seven days a week, 24 hours a day. That's why we do this. You know, it's not easy to do this every Sunday, but we do it with a purpose in mind. So you'll be able to feed on something every day to keep your mind engaged. That's what we're about. The mind has to be engaged to keep you focused. I want to see that happen to you. When we get up and running, there'll be a, mini a ministry staff that will be teaching and preaching all day, every day. Some people work the graveyard shift, the midnight shift. There'll be somebody available to be teaching and preaching at 3 o'clock in the morning. Always something around. For you to feed off of. If it's not a human being there, there'll be video school present for Bert Clinton to be teaching through, or Jacob Prash, or, or uh, David Paulson, or Derek Prince. Always something billowing. Praise and worship two, three times a day. Different praise and worship teams, different musician teams. Always just billowing. Man, why shut the church down? That's the lifeline to God. Keep the, keep the incense billowing. If you were in the Old Testament tabernacle, that incense, build them all day long. That's the prayers going up all day long. Sacrifices around the clock. Man, this is perfect, man. The devil is terrified of this because he knows you get that generator burning like that and people are really engaged and involved. He got a serious problem. This ain't just an imaginary vision. This is the way this thing should have always, always been functioning. Now it's coming to life. We're going to get some people. If you listen by way of live stream, don't listen. It'll be 600 people that will hear this by tomorrow. Go to the website and contribute to what we're designing and planning here. www.omegaministries.org. Click on support, then donate. A million dollars will establish the first base camp. It'll seat 700 people or so, but you get 700 people together on one accord. You're in. Because you can engage. We can, get a, we can get three or four people on staff and begin to see this thing begin to expand its borders and set up other places around the nation and the world. Teaching people that a 25 day, seven day a week arena is what you need. Let's change the church thinking and church paradigm so that God is always on the move 24 seven. That's what it's about. We'll see healings, we'll see miracles. We'll see everything as the body ministry of Christ begins to forecast itself against the Antichrist. It's, it's here, it's time to move. Father, we thank you for this time. God, we ask you to bless those here today and those that are here by live stream in the future. MP3 broadcast, God, we ask you to bless it so people can get the full revelation of what we're saying. It's time for a new breed. God, raise up another kind of person now, a person that is now coming forth to see you move in a supernatural way. We're looking at family members bound and bruised by the devil. It's time to stop being double-minded. It's time to stop being afraid. We have nothing to lose with the devil dragging our kids to the pit of hell. I'm not going to stand here and watch my child down to hell because of my inactivity trying to psychoanalyze them. It's no time for psychoanalysis now. We've got to see a move of God in a supernatural way to win these souls for Christ. God, raise up people that have a strong intestinal fortitude. People that will stand in the midst of this inferno and proclaim truth, speaking truth to power. Taking no thought for my life. The blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. And I love not my life to death. All these bound people with all these perverted spirits all over them. I curse that perverse spirit in the name of Jesus. Break the back of that perverse spirit in Jesus' name. Homosexuality, lesbianism, sodomy, masturbation, and all these old freak spirits everywhere. 
God, break the back of that perverse spirit in the name of Jesus. Drive it off in the name of Jesus. Lift the curse of the Antichrist spirit, the perverse spirit. That mess that came through hip hop and rap, pornography, drugs and alcohol, perversion, fornication. Break the back of these spirits, God, in the name of Jesus. Send forth your power. Send the angels howling out of heaven. Break through the barriers of the devil in the second heaven. I bind the spirits over America. I bind the spirits over Atlanta. I bind the spirit over this hotel. I bind the spirit over homes represented here. I bind the spirits, God, that are trying to set up barriers against us. I break the strongholds of the devil, God, in Jesus' name. Everything forecasted through hip-hop, rap, all this perversion, everything coming out of the loins of Beyonce and Jay-Z and Nicki Minaj and all these perverse spirits, I curse those spirits in Jesus' name. I curse witchcraft. I curse all the witchcraft from Louisiana. I curse root working. I curse divination. I curse the divining power of soul ties. Every soul yoked to another person. I break those soul ties. Soul ties that came through molestation. Soul ties that came through all kinds of perversion. Soul ties that came through rape. Soul ties that came through abandonment. I break those soul ties in Jesus' name. God, come forth with power. Come forth with determination. Come forth with a warring spirit to destroy the yokes of the devil. Break those yokes, God, in Jesus' name. Break the yokes that cause mental incapacitation. Break the yokes that cause retardation and perversion. Break the yokes, God. Bloodline curses. Destroy the yokes of bloodline curses. Destroy the damage done by witches placing curses on bloodlines. Limitations and hindrances in Jesus' name. God destroy these yokes. Let the demons bow down to the presence of Almighty God. Break them down to the ground. Cast them down to the ground in Jesus' name. It's time for a supernatural manifestation of God. It's time to drive off the filth of the devil. Drive them off. In Jesus' name. Drive the devil off. In Jesus' name. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered, God. Scatter your enemies. In Jesus' name. We're not going to talk softer. Blind Bartimaeus cried out the louder. We're crying out louder for divine intervention. People are in dire straits. People are in desperate need. We're watching people lose their minds in real time. They are losing their minds. It takes divine intervention now. It takes somebody determined to stand up and do something now. We can't talk anymore. We've got to do something. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Loose us. Loose us. Loose us, God. Raise up these people from the north, the south, the east, and west. Bring Dunos Tabernacle into manifestation. This is not another church. This is about a base camp for warlords, for those that will become ground forces, soldiers of light that will really do this. I'm not here to talk about anything. I'm here to volunteer for combat. This thing is about combat now. I'm here to engage. God, do it. Do it. Do it. In Jesus' name. Do it. Do it. Destroy these yokes. Destroy these yokes. The Bible says the yoke shall be taken from off of our necks because of the anointing. The anointing breaks that yoke. Break the yoke. We're not going to give heaven any rest. Daniel prayed for 21 days. 
You'll get no rest, God, until you pour out your spirit on all flesh. The Bible says you'll pour out your spirit on all flesh. We'll have dreams. We'll see visions. We'll experience visitations. You'll get no rest by day and by night as the saints cry out, cry out for a visitation. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God, fill her with the Holy Ghost and power. Enough is enough. Take her into another realm in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Please, Lord Jesus. Let go in the name of Jesus. Please, Lord. Every bondage I lose her from. Loose her into the Loose her out of her belly. Let a river of living water flow. Jesus' name. Everything holding her. I lift it off of her in Jesus' name. Lift off of her. Turn her loose. Abandonment. Rejection. Loose her right now in Jesus' name. Let the Holy Ghost come upon her. Break the yokes of bondage off of her life in Jesus' name. I break these bondages from a childhood. I break the yoke of a childhood. I break the yoke of a childhood. You let her go in the name of Jesus. Let her go. 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 Fear. Independence. That steel wrapped around her. I break that thing down. I break these chains. Break these chains. Break these chains. I'm not letting anybody in and I'm not coming out. I break these chains. From a mama. From a daddy. Everything coming from a daddy. I break that yoke right now. Uh -uh, I break that yoke. If you come from a daddy, I break. I, I break this. I, I break this yoke. Break this yoke. Abandonment. Molestation. I break this yoke. Hatred of a man. I break this yoke. Performance. I break this yoke. Perfection. I break this yoke. I gotta be perfect. I got to be perfect. I break this yoke. If you came from a father, I break this yoke. Anything from her father, I come against it, God. I'm asking you to loose her from it right now. Loose her from it. Loose her from it. Loose her from it. In Jesus' name. You say the yoke shall be taken from off of our necks because of the anointing. We want to fight a productive war against the devil. It's time to see something break out. It's time to see something happen. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Tell Tim to come here and the spirit break out by Tim Walker's left on the on YouTube and play it. God. There are, there are mainline forces in the army, then there are reserves. We need the reserves now. There's some folk that have been held out of this thing, held back in the background as reserve forces. We need those reserves called up to the forefront. This thing can be taken to another level. It's time to bring in the reserves, the heavy hitters. It's all kinds of matches in a, in a boxing match. Welterweight, featherweight, middleweight, light heavyweight. It's time for some heavyweights now. That last match is between the heavyweights. That's the main, the main match. It's the main contention there. It's time to bring in the heavy hitters to earnestly contend for the faith. God, these yokes, 
invisible yokes that the devil set up. We need to have maximized potential reached in Jesus' name. Maximize the potential is what we're after now. God, pour out your spirit on all flesh. The spirit of God can come down and break folks loose from all of this. This thing can be broken down. The Bible says men are always to pray and not to faint, not give up. We can't grow weary in well-doing. We can't grow weary in prayer. We've got to tarry until we're endowed with power from on high. We've got to see an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. God. A different breed of person. A different breed of man and woman. A different kind of human being is what we need. Somebody not afraid of these metaphysical forces. They're not afraid of the spirit world and the devil. The devil been walking all over the church because of fear. It's time for different people to be raised up who are not afraid of the devil. God, let the Holy Ghost come upon us and raise up a new breed of person in Jesus' name. There are answers to these prayers. There is an answer. We're not looking at all these warfares fought by Elijah with a standing army of angels and flame and, and chairs of fire. All the power displayed in the Bible, red seas parting, giants conquered in the promised land, axe handles floating, a man picked up by a chair of fire and taken to heaven. These are not fantasies and make-believe occurrences in the Bible. These things happen. We saw these things in the word of God occur. And these things happened. And here we are in 2017 with nothing supernatural happening. No power on display. No God in the environment anywhere. A dry wasteland, a dried up river with no power. That makes no sense. We're going to tarry until we're endowed with that same kind of Holy Ghost power that we see in the Bible. These people had power. It makes no sense. It makes no sense to expect anything less. They had power to stand and they witnessed the resurrection power of Jesus Christ on a daily basis in the book of Acts. One sermon and 3,000 people added to the church. God, it's something wrong. It's something amiss down here. How are our kids carted off and bound by the devil at his discretion? Taken captive by the devil at his will? That don't make sense. You're looking right into the face of somebody you know shouldn't be like this. Taken captive by the devil at his will? Whatever the devil wills to do, he can do it. And nobody can stop him. That's nonsensical. There's got to be an answer somewhere. There's got to be a breakout of the Spirit of God. There's got to be the Spirit of God coming down from heaven to earth. There's got to be a horizontal move in the, in the world. A ground war initiated. We're not playing. We're not fooling around. We're not interested in religion and church services. We don't have the restraint of time on us. Man, we got to see something happen. Or else these people are going to go to hell forever. When you die, you go to hell forever. And there's no reprieve. There's no retrieving you. You're damned. We can't afford to see these, see these people damned. We can have loved ones that are dying right now as we stand here. And they'll be damned forever. Unless somebody does something to see a move of God. No man comes to God unless the Spirit draws them. But the Spirit uses people to draw men. The Spirit uses people to draw folks through. You got to have a vessel fit for you to use. God, we got to wait on you to move in a supernatural way and see this thing come to pass. We've got to have that supernatural move of God. We got to have it, God. Look at the pitiful state of people. Look at how they are. Look at what's really happening down here. God, you've got to have mercy on these folk. 
We've got to see this move of God. We want to see you come alive and move in a supernatural way. Your presence, your power has to permeate the atmosphere. Lord, come on. We can't keep looking at the same old thing on a daily basis. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's open our Bibles to Hosea chapter 4. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's open our Bibles to Hosea chapter 4. The Lord's controversy with Israel. Let's stand before our feet, on our feet before the Lord our God. He says, hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Yet let no man strive nor reprove another, for thy people are as they that strive with the priests. Therefore shalt, shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people, and they set their heart on their iniquity. And there shall be like people like priests, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their doings. For they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase, because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. My people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declareth unto them. For the spirit of whoredom hath caused them to err, and they have gone a-whoring from under their God. They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills under the oaks and poplars and elms because the shadow thereof is good. Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom and your spouses shall commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom nor your spouses when they commit adultery for themselves are separated with whores and they sacrifice with harlots. Therefore the people that doth not understand shall fall. Though thou Israel play the harlot, yet let not Judah offend. And come not ye unto Gilgal, neither go you up to Bethaven, nor swear the Lord liveth. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. Their drink is sour, and they have committed whoredom continually. Her rulers with shame do love give ye. The wind hath bound her up in her wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Thus saith the word of the Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. And Father, where we've been found lacking and wanting, Lord God, this morning, Father, we ask that you forgive us from all sins. Lord, it's not, Lord God, our heart's desire, Lord Jesus, that we be turned away and not forgiven by you, Lord. But Father God, we want the mercies that you renew for us every day, Lord God. Lord, without those mercies, we can't make it in this life. And the devil will have open, open road to us, Lord God, to do whatever he wants to do with us, Lord. And how he wants to do it. And if you just said in your word, Lord, if we don't take heed, Lord God, and, and seek you and repent, Lord God, then he'll have our children, Lord. And that's what he's after, Lord God. The next generation, Lord God, to keep his world alive, Father. But Lord, you've called us out of darkness into your marvelous light, Lord. We don't take that lightly because it's an opportunity, a great opportunity and a privilege to belong to a living God that created the heavens and the earth, Lord. You did it, Lord Jesus, for us, Lord. It was your great pleasure to do it, Lord God. But Father, you called us at this time, 
Lord God, to do a great work in this world. The fields are ripe, Lord God, and the harvest is plenty, Lord Jesus, but your laborers are few. You said to pray for the laborers, Lord God, in this harvest. And Lord, we lift them up today, Lord God, because many have fallen away, Lord God. Going after profane words and, and lying tongues, Lord God. And after dumb dogs that won't bark, Lord God. Those are pastors that don't have your heart, Lord. But Father God, they stand in pulpits, Lord God, as sheep. But they're in wolves, they're in sheep's clothing, Lord God. But they're raving in wolves, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we ask that you bring down your fire, Lord God, upon them, Lord. Consume them, Lord God, as they spew out the lies, Lord God, on those people, Lord. And to lead them astray, Father God. Lord, you're getting wearier and wearier, Lord God, with that thing, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we're here today to declare, Lord God, your words of truth, Lord. We ask that you bring forth liberty, Lord God, in the spirit, Lord Jesus. Where people can be free, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we don't look at what we see, Lord. We know, Lord God, we look at what we know, Father, and that's you, Father God. Lord, you don't vacillate, Lord God. There's no shadow of turning in you, Lord God. There's no variableness, Lord God, in you, Father. But it's you, Lord God, that stand, Lord God, forever, Lord God. Your word will stand, Father, because it's true, Lord. And Father, we thank you today for using us as your battle axes and your weapons of war, Lord, to destroy the kingdom of darkness, Lord God, to tear down his lies in the hearts of people, Lord, that they conceived as the truth, Lord God. Father God, we ask that you come against it, Lord God. Hard today, Father God. Go down deep, Lord God. Hold thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's open our Bibles to Hosea chapter. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's open our Bibles to Hosea chapter 4. The Lord's controversy with Israel. Let's stand before our feet, on our feet before the Lord our God. He says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish, with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Yet let no man strive, nor reprove another, for thy people are as they that strive with the priests. Therefore shalt, shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me, Therefore will I change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people, and they set their heart on their iniquity. And there shall be like people like priests, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their doings. For they shall lead and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase, because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. My people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declareth unto them, for the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err, and they have gone a-whoring from under their God. They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills under the oaks and poplars and elms, because the shadow thereof is good. Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom, and your spouses shall commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery, for themselves are separated with whores, and they sacrifice with harlots. Therefore the people that doth not understand shall fall. Though thou, Israel, play the harlot, yet let not Judah offend. And come not ye unto Gilgal, neither go you up to Bethaven, nor swear the Lord liveth. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. Their drink is sour and they have committed whoredom continually. 
Her rulers with shame do love give ye. The wind hath bound her up in her wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Thus saith the word of the Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. And Father, where we've been found lacking and wanting, Lord God, this morning, Father, we ask that you forgive us from all sins. Lord, it's not, Lord God, our heart's desire, Lord Jesus, that we be turned away and not forgiven by you, Lord. But Father God, we want the mercies that you renew for us every day, Lord God. Lord, without those mercies, we can't make it in this life, and the devil will have open, open road to us, Lord God, to do whatever he wants to do with us, Lord. And how he wants to do it. And if you just said in your word, Lord, if we don't take heed, Lord God, and, and seek you and repent, Lord God, then he'll have our children, Lord. And that's what he's after, Lord God. The next generation, Lord God, to keep his world alive, Father. But Lord, you've called us out of darkness into your marvelous light, Lord. We don't take that lightly because it's an opportunity, a great opportunity and a privilege to belong to a living God that created the heavens and the earth, Lord. You did it, Lord Jesus, for us, Lord. It was your great pleasure to do it, Lord God. But Father, you called us at this time, Lord God, to do a great work in this world. The fields are ripe, Lord God, and the harvest is plenty, Lord Jesus, but your laborers are few. You said to pray for the laborers, Lord God, in this harvest. And Lord, we lift them up today, Lord God, because many have fallen away, Lord God. Going after profane words and, and lying tongues, Lord God. And after dumb dogs that won't bark, Lord God. Those are pastors that don't have your heart, Lord. But Father God, they stand in pulpits, Lord God, as sheep. But they're in wolves, they're in sheep's clothing, Lord God. But they're raving in wolves, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we ask that you bring down your fire, Lord God, upon them, Lord. Consume them, Lord God, as they spew out the lies, Lord God, on those people, Lord. And to lead them astray, Father God. Lord, you're getting wearier and wearier, Lord God, with that thing, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we're here today to declare, Lord God, your words of truth, Lord. We ask that you bring forth liberty, Lord God, in the spirit, Lord Jesus. Where people can be free, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we don't look at what we see, Lord. We know, Lord God. We look at what we know, Father. And that's you, Father God. Lord, you don't vacillate, Lord God. There's no shadow of turning in you, Lord God. There's no variableness, Lord God, in you, Father. But it's you, Lord God. To bring us out, to take us in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you back here next Sunday, 10 o'clock a.m., Wednesday night, 730 Bible Study. Support Dunamis Tabernacle, OmegaMinistry.org. Prayer tonight, 641-715-3670. Access code 409-367. It's time to move on to higher ground. In Jesus' name. Be blessed. See you back here next week.